Welcome to the unit on Introduction to Apparel Manufacturing. In this unit, you will be introduced to the apparel manufacturing industry and an insight into the history and origin of the industry. You will also get an overview of the global market as well as the glimpse of the industry in India. This unit comprises of two modules and a final review section that invites you to reflect on what you have learned. By the end of this unit, student will be able to understand the history and origin of the apparel manufacturing industry, understand the apparel industry in India. In the first module, you will get an overview of how apparel was manufactured initially and the impact of the industrial revolution. Food, apparel and shelter are the base of pyramid of needs for life. Apparel is one of the basic necessity of a human being. Before the invention of sewing machine, almost all apparel products were locally made with hand stitch. Apparel was manufactured by tailor in most towns that could use the make through process or a single garment for customers. Ready to wear garment though present was limited in variety. During that time, jackets and coats were known as outer wear or undergarments were purchased using predefined sizes. Here is an example of apparel. Sewing machines emerged in 19th century. They helped streamline the production of clothing. During the industrial revolution, apparel production was machinized with sewing machines. This video traces the development of the sewing machine. The sewing machine was really the first machine of any sort to enter the home. When it first appeared in the 1850s, it was regarded as the miracle of its age. To the people of the time, it must have seemed almost inconceivable that a machine could do such a fiddly and complicated action as sewing that I find quite difficult enough with both hands and a lot of concentration. Personally, I still find sewing machines quite magical how effortlessly they work, producing such perfect stitches and without hardly ever tangling up. To make a machine that directly imitated hand sewing would be very difficult. The real secret of machine sewing has been to find a completely different sort of stitch that's more suitable. The first clues came from a sort of embroidery decoration popular in the 18th century. This used the hook needle and formed a so-called chain stitch. The needle never needs to go right through the fabric, so it can be firmly fixed to part of a machine at the top. The first attempts at mechanical sewing imitated this embroidery stitch. The first patent was granted to Thomas Saint, an English cabinet maker, in 1790. When a model was made from his drawings a hundred years later, it had to be extensively modified before it would work. So it's doubtful whether Saint ever actually built one. The first person to build a sewing machine and put it to any practical use was a French tailor called Thimonier. After years of failure, he finally patented a machine in 1830. By 1841, he had 80 machines stitching army clothing in a Paris factory. An angry crowd of tailors, fearing that the invention would rob them of their livelihood, then broke into the factory and destroyed the machines. Timonier was ruined and eventually died penniless. This is a model of Timonier's machine in the Science Museum, which exactly imitates the hand embroidery stitch. We're having some trouble in uh, making it stitch, but uh, we have got to make, made it do a few stitches. Put it off, I think. Back again. Ah. 
Okay, keep it back. Thank you. you keep it. That's better. We haven't managed to make it stitch very neatly. But even if the machine was properly set up, chain stitch still has the disadvantage that it's very easily pulled apart. Unknown to Thimonier, other inventors were experimenting with a different sort of stitch, lock stitch, using two separate reels of cotton. The machines were more complicated, but the stitches they produced were neater, and uh, they didn't pull apart so easily. The secret of these machines was really the brilliant shape of the needle itself. We've made a giant one here, and you can see the eyes in the pointed end of the needle, and it has a groove all the way up one side that the thread can slip through. Well, with a real needle, if I push it through a bit of uh, cotton and pull it out again, it automatically leaves a loop underneath. And all the machine needs to form a stitch is to pass the second reel of cotton through the loop. The first lock stitch machine was built in America by an inventor called Walter Hunt in about 1833. It didn't work very well, so he lost interest and didn't even bother to patent it. Elias Howe patented an improved machine in 1845, and despite an initial lack of interest, this then acted as a catalyst to other American inventors, and within ten years, all the major elements of a modern sewing machine had been introduced. I'm going to try and demonstrate these with this human sewing machine, stitching together two sheets of expanded polystyrene. The needle goes through the material, the bottom bobbin is pushed through the loop, the needle comes out and the stitch is pulled tight, and the material is pulled forward. Every lock stitch machine has these four movements. Pushing through the needle, passing the loop round the bobbin, pulling the stitch tight, and moving the material forward. The movements are all connected to the motor by a series of ingenious mechanical linkages. First, the linkage to the needle itself. This is often just a crank, the simplest way to get an up and down motion from a rotation. Next, the device that pulls the stitch tight. This is basically an arm that flies up at the right moment, just as Ellie's was doing. But Ellie also had to grip the thread with her other hand to stop the thread being pulled from the reel instead of through the stitch. So on a sewing machine, there's a sort of friction pulley between the cotton reel and the arm. It's getting the thread to pass cleanly through these two things before the needle that always makes threading up a machine so elaborate. The action of the arm itself is surprisingly simple. Just two levers fixed to the needle mechanism. It's wonderful what a vast range of movements can be derived from simple cranks and levers. These are some collecting boxes I made for the Science Museum. They're actually portraits of people who work here. The idea was to show exactly what a donation would fund, so a pound makes them work for ten times long as 10p. This is the curator. He takes the pipe out of his mouth and then scratches his head. If you look inside, you can see the arm is a simple crank connected to a geared motor. Back to the sewing machine. The next action is passing the thread loop round the bobbin. This is what Ian was doing in the human sewing machine. To me, this is the most magical part, how it manages to do it without tangling up. On a real machine, instead of passing the bobbin through the loop, the bobbin stays still, and a sort of rotating hook pulls the loop so it's large enough to pass right over the bobbin. With the bobbin back in place, all you can actually see is the red thread slipping round the outside.
The last movement, pulling the cloth forward for the next stitch, is technically called a four motion feed because the tooth metal bit moves forward, down, backwards and up again. It does this with these two off centre rings on the drive shaft. The one on the right pulls the claw backwards and forwards, the other one makes it go up and down. So both combined give the four motions. This completes the basic mechanism, all four movements connected to a single drive shaft. This is actually a toy made in Germany about 1893. It's called the Nuremberg Lady or Nuremberg Princess. It's patented. The cotton goes in here, that's the bobbin. It comes through a tensioning system. It comes across to here, the needle would have been held in her hand. You see her head nods. Although it is a toy, it has all the mechanical characteristics of an ordinary soul. And let's breathe and release right into cobra position. Continue to relax and release that negative energy. Inhale, arch. Thrust your pelvis to the sky. And exhale, release into the stretch. Good. Focus, focus, focus. For the great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down. We do the hips to the sky thing again. That, that was great. Make it a Bud Light. She's not very relaxed. I've been collecting sewing machines for about 15 years. And about three years ago, a few of us got together and decided to form a society to pass on information and share information and find out what was going on. And it is now an international sewing machine collector society, which we show on Twismax. And we have members all through the world, America, Australia, Hong Kong, all throughout Europe. And uh, I just brought along one or two of my machines to show the very different types that are available. These come, that comes from France, Germany, those are America, this is Glasgow, and that one's from Coventry, an English made machine. And every one is slightly different the way it developed. Well, a very unusual machine is uh, this little one here. Unlike the rest of the machines, this isn't painted or brightly coloured. It's nickel plated, looking a bit like a giant stapler. Very, very nice noise, a bit like a puffer train. Now, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why this machine should have hands. No reason apart from being pretty. Why somebody should do it, I don't know. It was made in Coventry by a man called Starley, and his trademark was Lady Godiva on a horse. The lion, the beast, uh, it was made by a Glasgow company called Kimball and Morton about 1863-ish. As a sewing machine, it's quite ordinary, it's just a shuttle mechanism, it's just unusual because of its shape. Now this is a French machine. It's called La Populaire and it's certainly a very popular machine among collectors. Although it's called um, it works on an average system. We always call it the pusher. And it is one of the very few to use this unusual push start mechanism. But we've seen all these very different looking, very complicated, very simple mechanism machines. But one of the simplest, one of the prettiest, one of the most popular and probably, in my opinion, one of the best. The Wilcox and Gibbs. The early machines were all beautifully decorated. I think this was because the sewing machine was the first machine to enter the home. At the time, all other machines were industrial. Lavish decoration was an attempt to make them look more domesticated. At first, the different manufacturers' machines had very distinct characteristics. But by the 20th century, they'd all started looking more and more alike. This was partly due to the commercial dominance of one particular manufacturer. Oh, 
John, I'm so discouraged. How can I ask anybody to this house the way the furniture looks? Well, it is pretty awful. But I don't suppose we could buy much with our money. Not unless a miracle happens. Ah, there's the miracle. Hurry, 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 hurry. Answer that doorbell. That's the first time I ever saw a miracle in a two-pants suit. But it's the singer man. He'll send her to the nearest singer sewing center, and the miracle man turns her over to that miracle woman, the sewing teacher, to you. Just a few simple lessons on the sewing machine, and her house will look so attractive, they'll probably sell it at a profit. Now, let's take a look at the finished room with the rest of the girls she's invited over. You don't mean to tell me these draperies, curtains, and slip covers yourself. How did you ever make them so perfectly? It's a grand color scheme. They must have cost a pretty penny. Only $18.31. What? Why, I wish I could sew like that. But you can, Martha. What's that? The address of the nearest Singer Sewing Center. Get it? The company was founded by a man called Isaac Merritt Singer. Although Singer was trained as a mechanic, his real love was the theatre. Julie, I've always loved you, honey. Can you ever forgive me? Oh, this is Whoa. so sudden. Oh, Homer. In 1839, he managed to sell a design for a mechanical excavator for $2,000. Power gets to the bucket, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll buy it. And with the money, he set up his own theatre company called the Merritt Players. Oh, I'm rich. I'm rich. Now I can start my theatre company. Sting him up. Oh, oh no. God damn hell, oh. I will. Oh. Hey. Oh. Oh. See, oh. honey, I told you I'd save you. Oh, Julie. My hero. Singer's theatre company went bankrupt after a few years. Then, in 1851, he came across an early, unreliable sewing machine. I could do better than this. He built his prototype in only 11 days and then went into production. Singer's machine wasn't particularly original, but he was brilliant at selling it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this machine sewing before your very eyes. Here is trousers. your trousers, Isaac. Right Prove they're going to work. Yep. In partnership with a sober lawyer called Clark, he started the first ever hire purchase scheme. By 1867, Singer was a very rich man with a total of 18 children from a variety of wives and mistresses. But because the machines were being sold to respectable homes, Clark then persuaded Singer to leave the country. It's a one-way ticket. Oh. You gotta leave town. No? Singer eventually settled in Torquay, where he died in 1875, leaving a total of 24 children. From the earliest days of the sewing machine, attempts were made to find a better way of powering it than just turning a handle. In America, the treadle caught on immediately, because it was a great advantage having both hands free to control the cloth. But in Britain, it was regarded with great suspicion for many years. It was generally thought to be unladylike and rather harmful for the ankles. Attempts were made to power the machines by water wheels, giant clockwork motors and steam, but all were inconvenient. The first electric machines appeared in the 1920s. At first the motor was a separate lump bolted on. Only very gradually did it become integrated in the body of the machine. The motor itself is connected by a drive belt. This belt used to be rubber or leather, but on modern machines, um, there's a synthetic toothed belt, which has the big advantage that it doesn't slip. They've now replaced belts, gears and chains on many machines, like photocopiers. And let's breathe and release right into cobra position. Continue to relax and release that negative energy. Inhale, arch. Thrust your pelvis to the sky and exhale, release into the stretch. Good. 
Focus, focus, focus. For the great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down. We do the hips to the sky thing again? Yeah, that was great. Make it a Bud Light. She's not very relaxed. A couple of years ago, I made this trick suitcase for a conjurer clown uh, for a stage show. Um, it does several tricks, about eight of them in all, but uh, the relevant ones today are the fact it can walk off stage entirely of its own accord. Whereupon it can stop and then um, it can fall over. Um, the drive mechanism has worked entirely on uh, tooth belts. I use them quite a bit. Um, two of the tooth belts act as like caterpillar tracks and the third one is the drive. I'll show you it working. There are limitations to the movements you can get out of simple cranks and levers, so a lot of sewing machines also use cams. This machine's actually a cobbler's machine used for sewing leather. The cams can create a much wider range of movements using irregularly shaped slots and discs like this one. Just like cranks and levers, these have all sorts of uses, and I quite often use them myself. This is the warder in the Science Museum. I made the warder with a simple crank at first, but then he just moved his head evenly from side to side. And it didn't look at all realistic, it looked entirely mechanical. So I swapped it for a cam, and then it gave it a sort of jerky motion, and he actually looked as if he was looking around. And looking down at his watch was the same. Instead of a continuous down and up movement, it needed to be down, pause and up. So I used another cam. This is a doctor I made who writes out illegible prescriptions. Cams can be used for really complicated movements. Most modern sewing machines can do a wide variety of fancy stitches. They look a lot more complicated, but there's only one basic extra movement, and that's moving the needle from side to side. And by combining sideways needle movements with uh, variable cloth feed movements, all sorts of fancy stitches become possible. Each stitch has a different cam. If I change to a different stitch, the cam follower moves, and you can see it moving to a different rhythm. This is one of the latest electronic machines. The idea behind it is really quite simple. Instead of using cams to vary the needle and the cloth movements, it uses these devices called stepper motors. Each pulse of electricity I send it makes it go round one step. And I can use it to um, move a lever in just the same way as a cam. I'll try and imitate it over here. Uh... By programming a microprocessor to produce a rapid sequence of pulses to control the stepper motor, uh, the movements of the needle can be very accurately controlled. I th think you can see the stepper motor moving the needle in uh, this machine. The stepper motor is fixed to a cog which moves the needle in small steps. This machine is a faff. Today, Singer has lost its market dominance, and German and Swiss manufacturers now produce the most advanced machines. But I'm not convinced that all the electronics is really a good idea in the sewing machine. However good the design, there's still an awful lot more to go wrong than in a basic machine. And I'm not sure that all the fancy stitches are really worthwhile. 
The service engineers I've talked to say that uh, a lot of people never use them. With the old mechanical machines that used to last anything up to 100 years, the lack of obsolescence was quite a problem for the manufacturers. Singer used to have a policy of breaking up any machines taken in part exchange to reduce the supply of second-hand ones. I suspect all the complexity of the fancy stitches has added quite a convenient degree of obsolescence. But anyway, the golden age of the domestic sewing machine is perhaps already past. Make me a gown that is a perfect yes. fit, like yes. the one you made for Lady yes. When it first appeared, there were no clothes shops anywhere. You either made your own... Oh, or, if rich enough, got a tailor to do it. It will be a couple of weeks, ma'am. Even a generation ago, most families made some of their own clothes. <laughs> oh, yes! Oh, it's a dream! But the sewing machine, besides speeding up home sewing, also made the off-the-peg clothing industry economically successful. Home dressmaking is today just a minority hobby, and the home sewing machine has lost its central importance. Mm. Mm. Bit tight. The old machines were built to last a lifetime. Despite my doubts about the latest ones, they have to some extent carried on this tradition, and mechanically they're still surprisingly well made. I think that to make the machines fast, quiet and reliable, they have to be quite heavy and rigid and they also have to be very precisely made. And it's really these qualities that make them such wonderfully satisfying machines. Soon manufacturing shifted from small setups and small scale industry based production to mass manufacturing. Production systems become more sophisticated with the introduction of assembly line based manufacturing. Clothing production, on the other hand, continued to be made by hand. After the introduction of sewing machine, there was rapid growth of the ready-to-wear apparel business. The American Civil War was a crucial event in the chronological development of men's ready-to-wear apparel. At the beginning of the Civil War, most uniforms were custom-made in workers' homes under government contract. As the war continued, apparel manufacturers started building factories to increase production to meet the growing demands of the military. The mass production of military uniforms compelled the expansion of standard sizes. After this war, military measurements were considered to create the commercialized sizing for men's apparel. The bulk production of women's apparel developed slowly. During the 1920s, generally women's apparel continued to be made to order. During that decade, factors such as development of industrial production techniques and the rise of advertising industry, the growth of an ur urban professional class and the development of national markets accessed through chain stores and mail order catalogs contributed to the success of women's ready-to-wear apparel industry. RTW apparel was depicted as up-to-date and fashionable during those days as the new consumer industry swiftly redefined the way American customers reviewed mass-produced products. American women began accepting ready-made garments for their wardrobes as these ready-to-wear merchandise were cheaper, affordable and up-to-date. Most importantly, they were in tune with current fashion which could keep changing with fashion trends. However, RTW garments were found to fit poorly. The main problems faced during that time with ready-to-wear garments were regarding the fitting, drape and silhouette of these garments. Inadequate data about body shape measurements resulted in absence of a standard size chart and sizing system. Thus, manufacturer produce its own sizes. Manufacturers were using the same size with different dimension of apparel. This eventually led to additional cost of alteration, correction of merchandise and also 
return and replacement of large volume of products. Ultimately, these resulted in increased cost for end users of RTW garments. This problem in standard sizing led to the first large scale scientific study technique of women's body measurements for pattern making and garment construction. The main purpose of this survey was to find out key measurements of a female body. These measurements were important to predict other body measurements. These techniques of measurement were provided the basis for standard sizing system for women's apparel. This is a standard sizing system chart. Let us now view how a shirt is made in a factory. This video explains the construction of a t-shirt. The construction of some garments is more complex than others. Yet the construction of a modest t-shirt and an elegant dress shirt both require careful planning to assure they are made according to specifications. As a part of this process, manufacturers must know in advance all components required for manufacture as well as the order in which construction operations are executed. This section provides some details on those operations for constructing a t-shirt, a pair of jeans, and a dress shirt. The cutting process for t-shirts involves two separate processes. The layup and cutting of the fabric for bodies and sleeves, and the rewinding and bias cutting of fabric strips to be used for necklines and, in some cases, sleeve bands. Companies that produce fabric and also cut and sew the fabric will typically handle the tubular knit fabric in flat folded stacks. 
The fabric is laid in a zigzag manner during the disposal of the fabric from the last operation in the fabric manufacture sequence. These fan fold or book folded stacks may hold as much as 500 pounds, generally a little less than 500 yards of fabric, and will typically be moved on pallets. Depending on the wait time and distance of travel, these stacks may or may not be enclosed in cardboard or other covering. Production facilities that purchase fabric from multiple sources will frequently buy the tubular knit fabric on rolls. The practical limitation for the roll is approximately 80 pounds or yards. Consequently, there is considerable more handling required with rolls in addition to the expense of the cardboard tubes. A vast majority of commodity t-shirt manufacturers deal with fabric knit to the finished dimensions and spread the fabric as a tube. There are some companies, especially those that have a tapered side seam on their garments, that will slit the fabric down the side and spread the fabric as an open width fabric. We will concentrate on tubular fabric spreading. Spreading machines for tubular knit to size garments will turn the fabric 90 degrees as it is removed from the stack and positioned on the table. This turn will position the crease which originated along the folded edge of the fabric during finishing down the center of the spread, which will end up being the side of the garment after cut and sew. Tubular knit spreading machines are typically designed to handle either roll goods or flat fold goods, but not both. Therefore, the introduction of fabric packaged the wrong way will cause major turmoil in a cutting room. The savings of flat fold goods is also negated if the cutting room must unroll many rolls of fabric and stack in a flat manner. This loss is due to the fact that the placement of the end of the fabric through the spreading machine and over the stretching device, threading the machine, is quite time consuming. The spreader bars on the machine ensure that the edges of the fabric will be nearly even and allow for more precise cutting. With the fabric loaded on the sideboard of the spreader, the operator will move the machine along the table for the predetermined length of the marker. Some spreading machines are manual and must be pushed by the operator, and others have motor drives with which the operator must simply activate the throttle on the machine. Of course, motor drive machines will allow the operator to better watch for defects in the fabric. The length of the spread is determined by a combination of the number of different sizes of shirts and the total number of shirts in the cut. As can be seen in these two examples, the longer spreads are much more efficiently laid on the table, reducing the labor cost. Once the appropriate number of plies are laid up, the marker, comprised of pattern pieces, is positioned on top of the fabric, and cut lines are marked on the fabric by dusting a colored chalk through perforations in the marker material. In the case of body width t-shirts, the resultant lines will be in the center of the spread for the armholes, and curved lines at the top of the body panel for the front and back neckline. The reciprocating blade cutting knife is operated by one of the more highly paid direct labor operators in the plant. An operator in a progressive and safe facility might be wearing protective earplugs or a work glove on the controlling hand, but will definitely be wearing a steel or Kevlar mesh glove on the free hand. The cutter will typically cut the long spread of fabric into segments containing a body and one or more sleeves by cutting the straight edge of one of the pieces across the width of the fabric. The resultant block will be maneuverable and can be moved to the edge of the table for more accurate cutting. The cutter trims the edges of the sleeve and then cuts the curved top, thus removing the sleeve from the lay of fabric. The two curved lines, which will become the front and back necklines, are then cut at the top edges of the body panel. The center line keyhole is then cut, which will become the armholes when the shirt is opened up for sewing. While the body pieces are cut with a manual cutting machine, the trim fabric for the neckline and or sleeve bands are cut in an entirely different manner. The roll of fabric is fed onto a machine at an angle. 
A circular knife is used to split the fabric tube and provide an open width piece of fabric. As the fabric is cut, it is wound at the same degree of angle onto a separate roll. This roll is then positioned on a machine equipped with a circular knife similar to a meat slicer or carpenter's saw. The roll of fabric is then sliced into appropriate width strips to be used for trim items on the shirt. The bias winding of the fabric imparts additional stretch to the knit fabric. Care must be taken to match the fabric color of the strips to shirts cut from the same shade of body fabric. The appropriate yardage must be accurately calculated to finish the cut shirts without waste or shortage of trim. This t-shirt is cut from body width goods and consequently there is no side seam required on the garment. Such construction necessitates that the sleeve be set in the round, meaning that the sleeve has the side seam completed, turning it into a small tube before it is set into the body of the shirt. To improve efficiency, the sleeve is hemmed while it is in a flat configuration, and afterwards the side of the sleeve is closed. The hem on the sleeve is accomplished by feeding the folded edge through a chain stitch machine, normally designated as a cover stitch. An air-assisted folder improves the quality of the sleeves and also lessens the attention required of the operator. A stack of cut sleeves is fed through the folder and collected in a box or bin on the outfeed side of the machine. More automated factories will have an electric eye on the machine to stop the machine when the edge of the fabric reaches the needle. This reduces the amount of thread used and should reduce the amount of thread breakage. Some factories run chain stitch machines even when there is no fabric under the needle, but there is significant thread waste with this procedure. The closed sleeve operator receives sleeves connected in a chain from the hem sleeve operation. The sewing of the two edges of the sleeves is done with another type of chain stitch commonly called an overlock. This machine has a side cutting knife which is designed to remove a small amount of fabric during the formation of the stitch. However, poor operator handling can force the wrong amount of fabric to be cut off, resulting in an improper sleeve measurement. The operator must accurately align the leading edges of the sleeve to assure a first quality garment. It is also imperative that the operator fold the sleeve in the correct direction to consistently have the face side of the fabric on the inside of the resulting tube. Disposal should be in a manner to facilitate transport to the assembly area of the plant. Assembly of the t-shirt begins with the join shoulder operation which requires two separate sews. Because of the cutting method, the operator must fold back one ply and then crisscross the shoulders in order to match a front and a back shoulder. A plant with efficient methods would use the method shown, in which the shirts remain tied in a bundle during the sewing operation, thus drastically reducing handling. The average plant and or operator might well handle each shirt individually. This more efficient method requires more skill and attention on the part of the operator. The machine in this operation utilizes a side cutting knife requiring the operator to carefully align the edges of the shoulder. Special care must be taken to maintain straight edges and square corners because of the bulk of the shirts tied in a bundle. The subsequent operation is set collar band. Collar strips have previously been cut from either rib knit fabric or on the bias from body fabric and sewn into rings of the appropriate length for the size being sewn. The circular strips may be sewn together by the set collar operator or as a parts operation and then stored at the set collar machine, which is an overedge machine raised on the tabletop. The folded strip is placed on roller, set to the correct size, and the shirt is placed over the collar band. Because of the stretchiness of the collar fabric and the handling of three plies of fabric, the operator will typically cut off a little additional fabric with the edge trimmer to achieve an even edge of all plies. Allowances should be made in the patterns for this cutoff. A progressive factory may have installed vacuum devices, as seen here, to remove the trimmed fabric and thread from the work area. Again, a well-engineered plant may leave the shirts tied in a bundle for this operation. The increase in difficulty is not as extreme as in joined shoulders. The bundle of shirts is passed to the tape, neck, and shoulder operation. The operator is able to leave the bundle tied up 
and then pulls the garments onto the sewing head of an off-the-arm two-needle chain stitch machine. These machines can typically show straight rows of stitching or a zigzag on the bottom, depending on the specifications of the shirt. As can be seen, this specialized machine has the sewing and feed mechanism located in a cylindrical arm located away from the main body of the machine. This machine design allows the seam to be sewn on a garment that is essentially an enclosed tube of fabric after several seams have been sewn. The seam tape is actually a strip of fabric typically cut on the straight grain of the fabric to reduce stretch in the strip. The strip is fed through a folder which turns under the edges before it is stitched over the previous seam. The resulting layer of fabric serves to protect the shoulder seam, keep raw fabric edges from rubbing on the neck of the wearer, and add stability to the shoulder. This machine has a chopping device that trims the thread and the end of the fabric tape at the edge of the shirt. One or more labels are inserted at the center back during the sew along the back of the neckline. The hem bottom operation can be done at any time during the sewing process because it is unaffected by the other operations. The bundle is opened at this point and the shirts are handled individually. The machine used is of cylinder bed design which is raised above the table surface and the lower workings are in an enclosed case to allow the garment to be sewn in a circular motion. The operator must initially turn the hem under by hand and then gently guide the lower edge of the garment under the foot of the sewing machine. After overlapping the ends of this operation, take sleeves that had the underseam sewn into a tube in a previous operation and sews them into the hole formed on the side of the garment by the joined shoulder operation. This operation is one of the more difficult tasks because of the two circular edges involved. The operation utilizes an overedge machine with a side knife and the operator must be careful to not change the shape of the armhole or introduce pucker into the seam. Operators in the background can be seen turning the shirts inside out to prepare for the final operations. In this factory, a vacuum system is utilized to draw the sewing waste from the machine. This operator, also setting sleeves, shows the correct way to wear a dust mask if the operator chooses to wear one. After the sewing operations are completed, the t-shirt must still be inspected, have any remaining threads trimmed and removed, and then be packaged. These work elements can be combined in numerous ways to achieve an acceptable finished product. The operator performing the inspection will frequently turn the garment right side out. Then the garment will be checked for both sewing and fabric defects. Stacks at the inspection station will be used to segregate first quality garments from repairs and irregulars or non-repairable garments. Critical areas will be checked for remaining thread and then the t-shirt will have the loose threads vacuumed away and some minor pressing done on the areas that tend to pucker. Once the t-shirts are properly cleaned, they will be counted and placed in the appropriate carton. Once the completed cartons are accumulated and scanned, they will be placed in the truck for shipment to either the warehouse or customer staging area. This video explains the construction of a dress shirt. Little variation occurs in the construction of men's shirts. Many construction processes are automated and as a result are likely to consistently produce a more superior garment. For dress shirts, the entire sleeve is processed in one workstation on the UPS line. The operations performed are set placket, box the placket, fold the end under and top stitch, and then button sew and button hole placket, approximately halfway down the sleeve opening. The close-up of box sleeve placket shows the difficulty of the task. For this reason, the operation is a frequent prospect for automation. The sleeves are then ready to attach to the garment because the cuffs cannot be attached until after side seaming, which have also been reinforced with a lining. The lining on each of the components can be sewn in or may have been attached using a heat-activated adhesive. Sew lining and hemband is an operation to provide stiffness to the band 
and provide a finished edge on the inside of the shirt when the collar assembly is set. The set band operation attaches two bands to the made collar from the center outwards in order to assure evenness of the band ends and the centering of the collar on the shirt after being set. The operator may shape the end of the bands as a separate motion or even use a template in order to maintain the desired shape. For a manual set and close collar, the back band must be longer than the previously hemmed front band. Once the bands are set, they must be turned with the face side out and creased in order to facilitate edge stitching, which is very narrow top stitching. Depending upon the fabric, the operator may need to use a pointing device and a heat press for turn band. The narrow top stitching in edge stitch band is performed on a single needle lock stitch machine and provides support for the entire assembly. In order to allow easy setting of the band collar assembly to the shirt, the stitch must begin approximately one eighth of an inch above the point at which the two bands join. This gap will allow a subsequent operator to hide the corner of the shirt inside the band. Once the bands are edge stitched, a consistent width of the finished collar assembly is assured by running the assembly through a machine without a needle, but equipped with a side cutting device. After this trim band operation, the band collar assembly is now ready to be attached to the shirt. The inner cuff ply has the inside edge hemmed before the cuff is assembled. This option Make cuff is one of the operations that is frequently automated. Some of the variations in the final shirt are changes in buttons or button holes for cuff links. Once the operator loads the pieces of cuff fabric and a lining into the machine back, the cuffs must still be turned right side out and top stitched before being sent to the assembly area. After the cuff is made, it must be turned right side out and pressed to shape. This turn and press cuff operation is performed on a two-blade machine which allows the operator to turn and position one cuff while the previously positioned cuff is being pressed. The temperature and the time of the press is determined by the fabric of the shirt. The buttonhole cuff operation is performed on a tandem machine setup because of the long sew and cut time of the buttonhole machine. The operator works on two different bundles at the same time. While one buttonhole is sewing, the operator can load a cuff from the other bundle. This is possible because the machine clamps the cuff to a plate on the bottom of the machine during the sew cycle. Once the sewing is complete, the machine cuts a slit in the cuff precisely between the two rows of stitches. Buttonholes can be sewn with either a lock stitch or a chain stitch. The button sew cuff operation is very similar to this setup. However, because the sew time is much shorter, the operator can only work with one bundle at a time. Cuffs are still handled while tied in a bundle, and the operator folds the end of the cuff down below the bed of the machine after the button is attached, and then positions the next cuff. This is frequently done using both hands in order to speed the process. Preparation of the back for assembly involves approximately three separate motions. Set label to yoke, form and stitch box pleat, and set yoke to back. In the combined operation, all motions are performed with a single needle lock stitch machine. The label designates the custom manufacturer of these shirts. The placement for the pleat is typically designated by notches and then held in place with a stay stitch. Setting the yoke involves aligning the outside yoke with the back and then positioning the inside yoke. This involves sewing three-ply of material, which is difficult to do without causing pucker in the seam. In some sewing establishments, these would be performed as individual operations. The two operations that might see significant improvement would be label set, which could possibly be done with an automatic tacker, and set yoke, which is performed using a table that moves in conjunction with the sewing machine to reduce pucker.
Top stitch yoke gives a more finished appearance to the back of the garment. The single needle lock stitch will provide some stability when the back and the yoke fabric are cut. The left and right front are treated individually because one must support the buttonholes and therefore has an interlining and the other hold the buttons. The button side, the right side on a man shirt, is called the under front and will hold the personalized label on these shirts. The operations for both fronts may be done at one multi-machine workstation on a UPS line. Hem under front or button piece is designed to give the front a finished edge as well as provide two ply of fabric to support the button stitch. The front is put into a folder of the appropriate width and then sewn with a single needle lock stitch machine. Two rollers at the rear of the machine are connected to the sewing machine with a belt and provide a puller to ensure a consistent feed of the fabric through the machine. When shirts are sewn in a bundle operation, leaving the thread chain attached from the top of one garment to the bottom of the next allows the puller to transition between the fronts without operator assistance. The operator inserts a care and content label during this operation which positions the label on the innermost portion of the finished shirt. A piece of interlining is attached to the left front of the garment to provide a crisp look to the front of the shirt as well as provide support for the buttonholes. Set top center lining can involve simply attaching the lining with a folded outside edge or a specially designed folder to form a pleated look to the front. In either case, the lining is fed through the machine from a roll and the edge of the shirt front is fed through a folder and sewn to the lining. For this shirt, a small single turn folder attached to the foot of the machine tucks the fabric under and positions it on top of the lining, leaving a folded edge to show inside the garment. A soft plastic wheel positioned behind the needle is synchronized with the sewing machine and pulls the fabric from under the foot at the appropriate speed. Once the interlining is set to the shirt, it is folded to the inside. Fold and iron top front turns the leading edge under and then is creased with a hand iron to form a straight edge. The resulting double fold gives three ply of fabric and the interlining to support the buttonholes and give rigidity to the front of the shirt. A clip and stack front operation is required after the hem or stitch front operation when the shirts are sewn in a bundle configuration. The clip and stack is considerably more efficient than handling the garments individually at the front operation. It is most useful after an automatic operation where it can provide an inspection point to detect any machine problems that were not noticed by the loader of the machine. Buttonhole and button sew fronts is performed at one workstation with machines that are set up with automatic indexers. The operator positions the shirt for the first location and after that step is complete the machine will automatically slide the front or index to the next location. Because the actual sew time is roughly twice as long, the buttonhole machine will be loaded and activated first. The combined cycle time of that machine will allow the operator to turn and load the button side of the garment. The distance between the buttons or buttonholes can be quickly changed by adjusting a mechanical stop or a computer setting depending upon the sophistication of the machine. The buttons are automatically fed into the machine from a vibrating hopper which can orient the buttons right side up. When the top center front is simply folded at the leading edge, a hold stitch is sometimes required to ease the difficulty of setting the collar. Stay stitch and trim top center is done with a single needle lock stitch machine. Once the garment is handled, it is also fairly inexpensive to also secure the bottom of the front to help the hem bottom operator. Match and trim fronts is performed before to ensure that the fronts, even with different turnbacks, are the same length. Exact matching can aid both the set collar operator and the bottom hem operator. The fronts will then even at the bottom front of the shirt and the evenness is important for the placement of the pocket. The top of the patch pocket must be hemmed along the opening. The shirt style determines the shape of the pocket and the stitch line of the hem. When this hem shape is consistent across many styles and capital is available, the hem pocket may be performed by an automatic machine. The operator positions the pocket in the loading station from which the machine moves the material through fold top, stitch hem, and stack. 
Pockets are then ready to be set to the front. Automatic pocket set is performed while the fronts are still separate entities. The pocket is typically measured from the high point of the shoulder and from the center edge of the front. Therefore, it is typically the last operation performed on the front. Virtually all pockets are set by programmable equipment because of the difficulty of the manual sewing operation, especially the triangular sewing at the top edges of the pocket. The folding components of the machine are quite expensive, and thus companies try to limit the variation in the shape and dimensions of pockets offered. The first operation in the assembly process is join shoulders. Because the top of the back has been completed with an inside and an outside yoke, the join operator must attach the single front to two back yokes. This is performed by inserting each of the yokes into an intern folder to position the edge of the yoke inside the finished assembly. The front is then inserted between the two yokes with the raw edge inside, secured by a single needle lock stitch. Thus, the term for this specific method is folder join shoulders. The roller behind the needle helps to keep the three-ply seam pucker-free. Less expensive shirts may use an over-edge machine and have the seam visible on the inside of the garment. The set collar operation is a very precise operation. Not only must the operator sew a relatively stiff straight edge of the band collar assembly to the curved opening of the neckline, but the ends of the collar must be accurately positioned to facilitate the collar being turned and stitched closed. While sewing across the back of the shirt, the operator must contend with the two plies of fabric. The single needle lock stitch machine uses a fairly narrow seam margin in order to reduce the amount of puckering as the collar conforms to the scoop of the neckline. Once the collar assembly is set and closed, the top button and buttonhole can be applied. Both of these are performed on the band portion of the collar assembly, but due to the closeness of the set collar seam, they cannot be done in the parts department. The buttonhole band operation is done first, and the placement of the hole is controlled by an edge gauge set up for the collar band style. The operator will manually mark the center of the hole and then button sew the band at that location. Attaching the sleeve to this particular shirt is a two-pass activity. The set sleeve portion is done with a single needle lock stitch and the top stitch portion with a single needle chain stitch machine. In many bundle factories, they would be performed by two different operators. However, combining the operations into the same workstation, as done in this factory, may improve the quality of the end product by eliminating the transfer of blame from one operator to another. Many shirts have the sleeve and side seam operation performed using a safety stitch machine, and consequently this shirt would be designated as having a single needle set sleeve. Set SN sleeve requires that the sleeve be offset from the body of the shirt to leave enough fabric to be turned under during the top stitching operation. The fact that these are two opposing curves requires the operator to be continually manipulating the parts to maintain a consistent seam margin. A folder device that provides an edge stop for each ply of fabric aids the operator. Any excess fabric along the shoulder of the garment should be trimmed off as a separate operation or be performed by this operator before the sleeve is set. Top stitch sleeve set requires a folder that turns up and over the excess fabric from the sleeve to be mounted to the machine table. After the fabric is inserted into the folder, the operator must utilize an edge guide mounted to the sewing machine foot to accurately stitch the correct margin. Trim and inspect before side seam is a cost-saving measure utilized because of the difficulty of repairing component pieces after the side seam has been closed. A cautionary note is that these same areas should not be inspected during the final inspection unless some subsequent operation is performed to the main body pieces. Single needle close and side seam is performed on a single needle lock stitch machine. The designation, again, is important because many shirts are closed using either a safety stitch seam or a felled seam. The operator closes the body of the shirt by joining the front to the back and also closes the length of the sleeve. In this case, the operator matches the sleeve set seam before positioning the shirt at the needle because that is one of the stated quality inspection points. After matching, the front is positioned into a single fold folder 
which folds approximately one quarter inch of fabric over the back. The operator must feed the appropriate amount of fabric into the folder throughout the entire seam. This becomes a little more difficult at the sleeve set seam. In order to be durable, the single needle side seam must be top stitched. The top stitch, side seam, and hem fronts operation on this shirt also incorporates bottom hemming the front panels of the shirt. The entire operation is performed with a single needle lock stitch machine which has a very small folder built into the foot of the machine. Because of the tight nature of the finished hem, it is many shirts have a continuous hem around the bottom. If the fold of the material and the seam width is wider, then it can be hemmed as a swing folder hem. The operator must manually fold both the beginning and the end of the hem at the edge of the front panels, and then swing the folder into place and hem the majority of the garment in a very quick motion. Once the side seam has been closed, the cuffs can be set on the shirt. As a finished assembly from the parts department, each cuff has a hemmed or finished edge and a raw edge. During the set cuff operation, the operator will sew the cuff to the shirt utilizing the raw extended edge of the cuff. If there are any pleats to be put in the sleeve, they will be folded in at this time. In this case, again noting quality improvements, the same operator will perform the closed cuff or top stitch cuff set operation. The operator must turn the cuff to the final position and then tuck the set cuff seam into the interior of the cuff making sure that all edges are squared up with the sleeve. The top stitch as well as the set operation are done with a single needle lock stitch. Final trim and examine removes all threads resulting from the operations performed since the previous inspection. Some of these may be cut with snips while some may be loose. The inspector will look at each of the seams for accuracy and also be watching for any fabric defects or soil that may have gotten on the garment. The finished garment is put through a three-step finishing process. The spot press operator presses the parts of the shirt that will show in the final packaging that will not be affected by the form cabinet press. The areas of concern, and therefore pressed, are the left cuff which will be folded on the outside of the garment and the bottom hem which tends to show roping because of the curves of the garment, especially around the side seam. The majority of the shirt is pressed during the form press operation. The shirt is placed on a form which expands to the appropriate size. The form is then put into a heated steam tunnel or into a chamber where heated external forms apply pressure. The shirt is automatically offloaded and stacked. Press, collar, and fold is the final operation before the garment is bagged and sent to the customer. The fold table is configured for a particular style and includes a heated neck form which expands to press the neckline plus a board onto which the shirt is folded. On the appropriate styles, the folder inserts collar stays into the provided pockets before positioning the shirt on the collar press. Collar strips, butterflies, cardboard, tissue paper, and pins will be inserted into the garment as instructed. Long sleeve shirts typically have one sleeve folded to the outside and pinned in place. The bagging and shipping instructions depend upon the customer.
Let us move on to learn how a pair of jeans is made. Constructing a pair of jeans requires more pieces and steps than a t-shirt. Jeans are constructed at two facilities. Operations are done both manually and automatically. Denim rolls are very heavy and are oftentimes handled one at a time with a forklift. Because there is a major issue of shade variation from one dye lot of fabric, most manufacturers try to group the rolls from the same dye lot together. Stackable pallet racks facilitate such storage and allow a large number of similar rolls to be delivered to the cutting room at one time. A supervisor or lead person in the cutting room will typically roll out the assigned marker on the cutting table. The marker will be checked to ensure that it is appropriate for the fabric being used, that all of the pattern pieces are included for the sizes designated in the cut order. The table will then be marked with the appropriate splice marks, and notation will probably be made of any variation in ply height from one section to the next. Because of the weight of denim rolls, most are loaded onto a spreading machine using a forklift, a hoist, or two people. The operator spreads the fabric according to the length of the combined sections in the marker. Roller bearings on the machine allow the roll of fabric to turn freely. The operator secures the fabric at one end and then allows the weight of the fabric to turn the roll and feed off the necessary fabric. This is possible with denim because of a little stretch in the fabric. The spreader will adjust the spreader cart to maintain an even edge of fabric onto the near side of the spread and watch for fabric defects as the fabric lays onto the table. Each end of each ply of fabric should be cut squarely and accurately to avoid wasting fabric or having garments with incorrect piece length. With directional fabric that has a face side, the company may choose to spread all of the fabric with the face side up. This requires the spreader to walk the length of the table without laying down fabric for each ply. The total height of a spread number of ply is determined by the cutting process used. Whenever the spreader finds a defect in the fabric, it must be cut out. Some of the flaws or joints are pre-marked by the fabric mill. To ensure that all garment pieces are complete, the spreader must use designated splice marks to determine where the fabric can be cut and restarted. Once the appropriate number of ply have been laid on the table, the paper marker will be rolled out and positioned to provide the cutter with an outline of each pattern piece. It is quite common to have multiple sections in a marker, each of which contains all of the pieces to make a designated number of garments for a particular size. Because equal quantities are not needed in all sizes, different sections may require a different number of ply. The appropriate paper marker should be cut to fit on each section to avoid distortion in the pattern pieces. The cutting process on denim requires considerable force because of the density of the fabric. Consequently, there is a limited number of ply that can be cut, regardless of whether the fabric is cut manually or with a computer-controlled cutter. The cutter must guide the knife through the fabric following the lines drawn on the marker laid on the top of the spread. Unfortunately, the more efficiently the pattern pieces are laid into a marker, the more difficult the cutter's task becomes. There are, of course, some areas where cutting accuracy is more important than others because of multiple pieces that must fit together. In addition to these areas, the cutter must pay particular attention to notches and corners. Shade mark parts is required because of the mentioned shading issues and the fact that a garment has pieces sent to many departments and then returned for assembly. Most manufacturers adhere a special sticker to each garment piece that denotes the size, bundle, and ply number of the garment. These stickers may be applied to all pattern pieces or just major body pieces. 
The numbering system makes the cutting room aware of missing pieces early in the process, as well as giving the sewing operator a checking mechanism to ensure that bundles have not been mismatched or have one or more ply out of the proper rotation within the bundle. Once the fabric is cut, control tickets are placed on each bundle of parts to aid in process control tracking as well as matching the appropriate parts. The bundle parts operation is where individual pattern pieces are tied into bundles and sent to the appropriate department where sewing begins. There are two basic types of pockets which are generally called patch or hung pockets. The patch pockets have the edges turned under. This is called a hem pocket. To finish the top of the pocket, the material is run through a folder and stitched parallel to the folded edge. The number of rows of stitching and the color of thread are often considered a style feature. When sewn by manually sliding the material into the folder, the operator must carefully control how much fabric is fed into the folder. It is typical to sew the pockets, still connected by the thread, into a box and then clip and stack them apart. The use of an automatic machine reduces the skill level of the attending person to that of a loader and will normally include the stacking function. When trademark definition and capital expenditure allows, the use of a programmable sewing machine greatly reduces the skill required and makes reproducing the exact contour of many different designs possible. The machine is equipped with a clamp that moves the pocket under the sewing needle, therefore only requiring a loader rather than a skilled operator. A lock stitch will normally be used to prevent the entire design from raveling out if one stitch is broken. Set patch pocket is very similar whether the pocket is set to the back panel of the garment or to a sub-assembly, as done when attaching the watch pocket to the front pocket facing. The operator must fold the edges of the pocket under and then accurately follow the designated contour of the pocket. Depending upon the style features, this may be done with a single needle or double needle lock stitch. To increase flexibility, the operator may use a double needle machine but remove one needle for the appropriate single needle styles. There are numerous methods of ensuring proper placement of the pocket, one of which is to mark the pocket outline, usually with chalk. The difficulty of this operation and the lack of skilled operators has forced many companies to spend the money for automatic pocket setters. These computer or cam controlled machines require special attachments for each style and therefore limit the variety of pocket shapes offered. Hung pockets are pieces of fabric, either the same as the garment or some less expensive pocketing material, that are attached to the pant at a seam and form a bag or pocket when finished. When a different material is used, the customary practice is to sew a piece of the body fabric, a facing, onto a portion of the pocket that will show in the finished garment. Set pocket facings is the operation that attaches the facing to the pocket bag. Labels or decorative items may be attached to either piece before they are sewn together. The join out seam or side seam is performed on this style with a single needle lock stitch. While not common for jeans, this stitch would allow for easier alterations of the garment. If the stitch should break, it will not unravel. The operator uses an edge guide to maintain a consistent seam margin down the side of the pant. Bust side seam with a hand iron is an operation that spreads open the two ply of fabric down to the stitch line. This will ensure that the seam will be evenly distributed in the bottom hem of the leg. The set waistband operation attaches a folded band to the completed pair of pants. The band is cut from the marker and is long enough to encircle the finished circumference of the pant plus enough to tuck into each end of the band. The operator inserts the band into a folder that turns the lower edges of the band to the inside, creating a finished edge inside and out. The operation is performed with a multi-needle chain stitch machine, which in this case utilizes three needles. The lower two needles secure the band, while the upper needle secures the fold at the top of the band. 
The operator must tuck the ends of the band inside after the folder is created by the folder and before the band is positioned at the needle. At the trailing end of the band, the operator must also tuck the ends before the edge of the garment goes under the sewing machine foot. Using a cylinder bed machine makes it easier to sew the circular top of the pant. Pressing the continuous chain may aid the automatic machine in measuring the loops and detecting the overlap joint so that the joints will be cut out and not go onto a pant. Setting belt loops is normally a difficult task because of folding the short ends and holding them in exact position during the sew. An automatic loop setter reduces the difficulty of that task to simply being able to position the garment band in the proper location for the loop. The machine will cut the loop to the proper length, fold the ends under, and then sew both ends of the loop. The machine may have a red dot light to aid in positioning. The position of the stitches on the loop must match the style feature. Once the waistband is complete, the buttonhole is sewn into the end of the band. This particular sewing machine is computer controlled to set the length of the buttonhole and the number of stitches. These specifications will be determined by the size of the button to be used on the finished jean. The operator simply positions the pant into a guide on the machine bed and activates the machine to complete the sew, thus reducing the skill required. The sew time is long enough to allow the operator to grasp the next garment. Reinforcement of the front pockets has developed into a marketing tool. Many of the rivets are custom produced for a jeans manufacturer. Even when more commonly available rivets are used, the placement is dictated by the spec sheet and may be used as a style feature. The pocket rivet can be set with a motor-driven machine where the rivets are fed from a hopper and the operator simply activates the machine. The placement of the rivets may be guided with the use of a red dot pointer. The other extreme of this operation is when the operator loads the rivets into the magnetic holding die and then forces the rivet pieces together using a leg pressing motion. Set metal cap button is very similar to the rivet operation. Jeans typically do not have a sewn on button but have a pointed metal stud that is forced through the fabric and then a cap with a shank is forced down over the stud. In most cases, the operator will use an edge guide to position the garment. Some manufacturing plants will mark the placement of the button through the button hole and then use a red dot light to accurately position the pant. An equality problem at this operation will require replacement of the waistband and all subsequent attachments such as loops and labels. The metal caps are decorative and are frequently part of the trademark of the manufacturer. The press machine normally has both the studs and the caps fed automatically to the work position through a track. In some cases, the size or design of the cap or mechanical failure does not facilitate automatic feeding of the parts, and the operator must position one or more parts by hand. This significantly increases the time required for the job, but not necessarily the skill required. Trim and inspect pants is performed to detect any defects in the fabric or the sewing of the garment. When garments are to be washed, the function is typically performed before going to the laundry because any open seams will ravel during the wash process and render the garment unusable. There will typically be an after-wash inspection as well to prevent defective garments from going to the customer. The inspector will trim any excessive threads left by the sewing machines as well as determine the department or person that should make the necessary repairs. The button jeans operation is a fairly arduous task because of the thickness of the four-ply of fabric in the waistband and the inflexibility of the metal button shank. This stiffness is more contentious if the pants are buttoned before wash. A wire loop pulling device is a major improvement to the process. Special effects are a major style feature of denim wear. This broad shot shows that considerable space and personnel are required to create the final look. The design personnel of the garment are trying to create a very specific look of the finished jean. There are numerous methods of physically distressing the jeans in order to achieve different looks after the laundry process is completed.
The laundry process includes not only washing the garment, but also applying chemicals and enzymes that change the characteristics of the fabric. To achieve consistency in the garments delivered to retail, some of the specific features are marked on the jeans to guide the operator. In addition to the change of the feel of the fabric, there is a major focus upon making jeans look as if they are well worn when they're on display at the retail establishment. The two types of wear tend to be shown as specific lines or broad expanses through physical abrasion. The specific lines represent creases or wear points. Creating a wear line may be synthesized by using a rotary grinder or a sharp-edged abrasive stone or block to abrade the fabric. Broader areas of wear can be replicated by sanding with sheets of sandpaper or sandblasting the garment while it is supported on a form. Either of these steps is performed before the laundry process, which will allow the chemical to more vigorously react with the base fabric than the untouched portions of the garment. The other major method of changing the visual appearance of the gene is to cause a chemical reaction with the fabric during the wet processing of the garment. One of the primary chemicals currently used is potassium permanganate, but others are used for different effects. The chemical may be brushed on or sprayed on depending upon the desired effect and the consistency of the chemical itself. The combination of length of time the chemical is on the garment and the laundry process itself can create a multitude of results. The laundry process is a combination of washing and drying the garment with a variety of chemical treatments, detergent, and physical activation such as stone wash. The majority of machines are computer controlled for duration, chemical inflow, and speed. Acceptable results can be achieved with manually controlled machines but require strict monitoring to achieve consistent results. The desired effect is usually decided through trial and error sample wash processing in smaller machines and then must be converted to the commercial equipment used in the factory. The press pants with buck press operation is similar whether the garment has been washed or not but of course may require more steam, pressure, and time for the washed garment. The press used has separate controls for the steam, pressure, and vacuum. In this case, the operator presses the top of the garment by sliding the waist just slightly over the narrow end of the press and bringing the top of the press down in several locations as the garment is turned. Some locations will use a separate topper press for this step. The jeans legs are then positioned for the press defined in the specifications. This could be with a center crease or flat front and then pressed with the full length of the press. Jeans designed to have a more casual finish may be finished with an automatic form press. The pant is fit around an expanding top die and then the legs are clipped to the bottom of the machine. Steam is forced through the legs to smooth the legs and the upper form introduces a press from the inside out for the top. Once the press is complete, the jeans are typically folded and packed in bulk to ship to the customer. This video explains the process of construction of apparel. You have a row of top stitching that is visible to the outside of the garment but the zipper itself is hidden underneath the seam allowance because the zipper is actually offset when you put it into the garment. We're going to begin with two pieces of fabric that have been marked for a one inch seam allowance at the top and the bottom. And unlike the invisible zipper, we are going to put the slot zipper into a seam that has already been constructed. In order to do that, I need to mark the bottom of my zipper. So I'm going to lay the zipper down on my fabric, matching the top edge of my zipper with the top edge of my fabric, and put a pin into the fabric at the bottom of the zipper, but at the top of the bottom stop. In this particular example, I'm going to have a very short seam. The 
Begin the seam with a back tack. And I'm going to sew up to the pin, which marks the end of my seam, and I'm going to end with a back tack. Seam allowance must be pressed open. all the way to the top. I'm going to place the zipper face down on the seam allowance. And I'm going to roll my seam allowance over one eighth of an inch. And I'm going to pin baste it. And you can see that my pins are lying right along the lightly pressed seam line. This is going to create the underlap for our lapped zipper. I need to change the zipper foot. I'm going to begin my stitching on that one eighth of an inch that I folded over next to my zipper coil. I'm beginning my stitching at the bottom of the zipper. Begin with the back tack. And as you reach your pins, you can pull them out. When the zipper pull gets in the way, stop with your needle in the fabric, open your zipper, and then proceed. And with a back tack. Close your zipper, fold your seam allowance 
open the way it was pressed and then you want to match the notches at the top of your zipper marking your one inch seam allowance and you can pin it closed. Flatten your zipper out Turn it over and examine it. Make sure that your seam line is lying nice and flat. And we're going to top stitch the second half of the zipper in. You may want to insert a pin from the right side through the top of your zipper tape to hold it flat because you're going to begin stitching at the top with the zipper open. You want your top stitching line to be at approximately one half inch. Begin with a back tack or a spot tack. and stitch down the edge of the zipper foot here is sliding right along the edge of the zipper coil and when you're down a couple of inches you can stop with your needle in the fabric raise your presser foot and close your zipper back up now you need to hold your zipper and your fabric taut to help prevent stretching. When you get to the bottom of your zipper placket, you want to stitch a couple of stitches beyond the bottom. Feel with your finger for that bottom stop because you don't want to hit that with a needle. Pivot and sew at a right angle to your seam line. Count your stitches three, four, five, six so that when you back up you can back up the same number of stitches. One, two, three, four, five, six. Take your work out of the machine. Pull your needle thread to the wrong side of the fabric. Cut short. There you have a lapped zipper. Give it a little bit of a press. everything should lie nice and smooth. So there you have the lapped zipper which is also known as a welt zipper featuring a placket that's stitched on one side and the zipper is under an overlap because we've offset it with our beginning stitching. The next zipper that we're going to do is a centered or a slot zipper. The zipper is centered in this placket so that each half of the zipper is totally covered with the seam allowance. It's a little bit trickier to put in, but it begins the same way. We have our fabric marked with an inch seam allowance top and bottom because we're going to be sewing our seam first. Place the zipper face down on your fabric matching the top edge of your zipper with the top edge of your fabric and we're going to put a pin in the fabric at the top of the bottom stop. 
the length of our seam is from the bottom of the fabric to our zipper. We're going to begin this with a regular zip with the regular presser foot. So we'll take off the zipper foot. The regular presser foot supports the fabric against the feed dogs on both sides of the needle. So it has a different purpose. And our seam with the back tack. And we're going to press this seam open as well. to make sure that you press the seam line all the way to the top of the placket, making sure that you maintain a nice even line. And give it a good press because we want it to lie nice and flat and maintain a nice crisp line. So we've got a nice sharp crease there on our seam line. I'm going to begin by placing my zipper face down but open. And I'm going to match the center of my zipper coil right along the folded edge of my placket and I'm going to pin baste to help it stay. Now it's important to maintain a one-to-one -one relationship along the distance of the zipper so we don't want to stretch the fabric and we don't want to stretch our zipper. And I'm going to put a pin at the top of the zipper on the opposite side. Change to presser foot. And I'm going to sew down one side of the zipper, across the bottom of the zipper, and then back up the other side. I'm going to want to count stitches when I make my pivot down here at the bottom so that I can have the same number of stitches on the other side of the seam allowance so that I maintain two parallel rows of top stitching to hold this. And I'm going to stitch this at just under one half of an inch. If I stitch it as tight as a quarter of an inch, I'm going to get a hump in the seam allowance over the coil, but I want it to lie nice and flat. By the same token, if I stitch it at a half an inch wide, my slot is going to look too wide. So I'm going to sew this at about three-eighths of an inch. And I'm going to begin with the back tack. And I'm going to carefully watch the folded edge of my fabric and keep it right in line with the zipper coil because I want the two sides of the zipper to meet and I want the two edges of fabric to meet but not overlap. And once I get a bit of distance on this I am going to reach behind so that I can support 
both the zipper and the fabric together to help maintain that one-to-one -one relationship. It may be necessary for you to remove your pin. As long as you've got something to hang on to, that's fine. As I near the bottom of the zipper, I'm going to stop with my needle in the fabric, raise the presser foot and close my zipper so I don't have to stitch around that zipper pull. When I get to the bottom of the placket, I'm going to pivot the fabric and I'm going to count the number of stitches to center. One, two, three, four. Then I need to come four stitches across the seam allowance. One, two, three, four. And then I'm going to pivot and come up the opposite side. I'm going to smooth the top so that I can make sure that the two sides of my seam line are matching over the top of the zinner zipper and everything is lying nice and smooth. Once I've come up a couple of inches and I'm going to open my zipper and when I get to the top I'm going to end with a back tack. Close and check and make sure that everything lies nice and flat and smooth and that we've got good coverage over the entire length of the zipper. And there you have a slot zipper insertion. Going along with the zippers is how to finish the top edge of the fabric. And I'm going to show you today how to put a facing on a waistline of a small skirt that I've made here where I've got an invisible zipper inserted. This is a neat industry technique here where we don't have a lot of excess fabric at the top. It gives us a nice and neat uh, finish at the top of the waistline, the top of the zipper. This particular facing is called an applied facing because it's a separate piece of fabric that has been cut and shaped to fit the top edge of your garment. In this case it's a skirt waistline and you see that there is curve in this over the entire distance. Now I've gone ahead and completed our skirt. I've sewn darts in the front waist and in the back waist. I have closed the side seams on both sides and my zipper is already installed. You'll recall from our invisible zipper lesson that putting the zipper in in this case is one of the very first steps that we follow. At this point, my facing is exactly the same length around the waistline that my skirt is. So I'm going to begin by matching my side seams on my skirt and the side seams on my facing. And I'm going to pin. On the opposite side, I'm matching my seam lines exactly. And when I open out my zipper at the back of the skirt, you'll see that my skirt and my facing are the same width. The first step I need to do is to trim some of the excess off on this facing. So I'm going to trim off about a half an inch. So now the facing 
is about a half of an inch shorter. And I'm going to do that on the other side as well. And once it's trimmed short, then I'm going to put that newly trimmed edge right alongside the edge of my seam here. And I'm going to pin it. And you'll see that all of a sudden my skirt has gotten longer than my facing. I'm going to pin the other side as well. And I'm going to stitch along the facing here. Stitch the facing to the zipper tape to the skirt seam allowance. You want to do this about an eighth to a quarter of an inch away from the edge of the zipper tape. And you're going to begin with the back tack, of course. And I'm going to stitch the same on the opposite side. it with the back tack. Okay, now I'm ready to sew around the waistline. And since my skirt is bigger than my facing, I am going to wrap the skirt right around the zipper coil. So if you can peek in here, right here, give me a close up on that. I have flattened out the facing and the skirt is actually wrapping around the coil of the zipper. Now I can pin and I'm going to pin over my darts to help make sure that they're going to stay in the direction that they've been pressed. I will pin across the darts on the front. Darts going across the back. And then on this side, I'm going to wrap the skirt around the coil of the zipper again. <clears throat> Change to the regular presser foot. I'm going to begin sewing around the waistline seam with a back tack at the beginning.
making sure that my seam allowances are staying nice and flat and the darts are not getting twisted as I sew over them. Raise your work and check. Make sure that everything's lying nice and flat under there. I'm coming around the back. Now before I trim, grade, and clip the seam going around the waistline, I'm going to pop the facing so that it's right side out. And I'm going to check to make sure that both sides of the zipper are the same length. And they are. So I'm good to go on the remainder of the installation. Okay, now this is just like our, our concave seam. So the seam allowance has to stretch as it goes around the waist when we've turned this right side out. So I need to reduce some of the bulk in the waistline seam. So I'm going to trim and grade this seam line. The skirt seam allowance is the one that is going to remain the longest. And I'm beveling with my scissors. So I'm getting two different widths on the remaining seam allowance. This helps spread the bulk out so that it will lie flatter. You can see I've got two different widths on my seam allowance here. Now I need to clip the curve. And as I come to bulk at the seam allowances, I'm going to trim that out just by clipping on the diagonal. And I'm only clipping one layer of fabric at a time here. Right now I'm clipping the facing seam allowance only. As I get to the seam allowance at the side seam, I'm going to clip that on the diagonal to reduce the bulk with that fabric. Turn my skirt over and now I'm going to clip the skirt seam allowance and I'm going to take care to offset my clips so that I don't have two clips 
sitting right on top of each other. And I'm going to trim out the excess bulk at the top of the darts. And when I get to the side seams, I'm going to trim the bulk away from the seam allowances. When I get to the darts on the front, I'm going to reduce the bulk there. to be careful not to clip your waistline seam line, however. Oops. I wasn't quite good enough at getting that out flat. I've got a seam allowance that's flopped over, so I'm going to take this opportunity to open that back up and stitch it right down. So it lays flat. If I didn't do this, that would leave kind of a wad of fabric there that would show through to the outside. Now there's no need to back tack on that little area there because I have overlapped a couple of stitches when I started and when I ended so that overlapping is going to to hold it. So now as this curve turns around in the opposite direction, which it's going to do when we turn it right side out, the clips are allowing that seam allowance to spread. But if you look carefully, you can see that each one of these clips has another piece of fabric underneath it so that we're not going to get any large divots on the outside of the garment when we press it when we're finally finished. You may also want to Trim down some of the bulk over the top of the zipper. You pop it right side out. Now we're ready to understitch the seam. So I want to make sure that my seam allowances are going to all fall to the right and I'm going to pull the facing of the skirt over the top of them and I'm going to stitch on the facing through two layers of seam allowance. I'm going to begin with a bit of a back tack. And as I do my understitching, I'm going to be checking to make sure that my seam allowance is lying out flat and that my facing is lying smoothly over the top. And I'm actually going to be pulling with my left hand on the skirt and with the right hand on my facing so I can begin to see the stitches of my waistline seam. And I'm going to line the waistline seam line up with the inside edge of the left toe of my presser foot. That's going to put my needle down about 
a sixteenth of an inch away from the seam line. Check and make sure that your seam allowances are lying to the facing side and nothing's getting flipped around in the opposite direction under there. You're not going to be able to get right into the corner of the facing at the top of the zipper, so you can maybe get to within an inch and a half of the zipper and back tack. Clip your needle thread close. Use your bobbin thread to pull the needle thread to the inside. Pop that facing back out. Trim on the opposite side of the opening. Trim your needle thread close. Then use your bobbin thread to pull your needle thread to the underneath side. Now, if I did a good job, you can see I don't have any of the little clips along my seam line flipping down into my skirt. Everything has been stitched up to the facing, which is as it should be. The next step is going to be to tack our facing to the garment so that it doesn't roll to the outside. So to do that, I'm going to use my finger and my thumb and I'm going to pinch part of my dart leg and my facing together so that I can kind of turn it around a little bit and stitch right on the dart intake to my facing. Take three or four stitches. Trim the threads nice and close. I'm going to come along to the side seam and I'm going to match the side seam on my facing with the side seam on my skirt and I'm going to do the same thing. It's going to be a little bit easier here because I have more to hang on to. Putting my finger underneath my seam allowance and then using my thumb to grab the facing and the seam allowance together turning it face down, but I'm holding it down tight, so I haven't lost where I pinched it. And I'm going to stitch on the seam allowance, three or four stitches, to tack it. going to smooth around and I'm going to do the same thing at the darts toward the front.
once again. Now when you're doing this, you want to be careful that you're stitching just to the dart intake or to the seam allowance of your skirt because we don't want these to show on the outside of the garment. So the, take, the facing has been tacked to the garment so that it won't roll to the outside and yet you don't see any of that stitching on the outside of the garment because it's all happened on the seam allowance and the facing or the dart intake and the facing. All we need to do now is just to give a press around the waistline of our skirt and our waistline is done. The trick on this was trimming the seam allowance of the facing at the very beginning. Remember that half inch we trimmed off? That's where it was, right there. So we have created a nice clean finish here at the corner without a lot of additional bulk and it looks nice and neat on the outside of our skirt. If you look very carefully here, you can see the waistline seam line and it's actually occurring on the inside of the skirt. Here's our understitching and that's what's holding that seam line to the inside. So on the outside of our garment, you've got a beautiful and clean finished edge. So this was an applied facing with the additional trick of finishing it for an invisible zipper. Our next facing is going to be what we call an extended facing. This is a shirt front, if you will, that's meant to button closed and have a 5 8 inch overlap so that when the centers of the fronts are aligned, we've got 5 8 of an inch on either side of center. Our extended facing has been cut as a single piece of fabric. So here 
we have the facing portion of the garment and I have already fused interfacing to it. We have both halves of the front and the front is marked with a notch at the fold line and a notch on either side of the fold which is at 5 eighths of an inch which shows our center line and then we have a notch at the mid neckline and a notch for our shoulder seam on our facing and we have the same notches occurring on our shirt front center front mid neck and shoulder seam the back of our shirt has an applied facing so we're going to join the applied facing to the extended facing and then complete our neckline we have notches showing our shoulder seams and a notch at center back. These notches are going to help us keep our pieces together so that they go together correctly. Our first step is going to be to put our applied facing, our back neck facing, to our front neck facing, which is the extended facing. So we're going to join it at the seam, at the shoulder seam, matching our notches. And we're going to begin and end with a good back tack. Because we, when we trim and clip that around the neckline edge, we don't want that shoulder seam to come apart. So we're joining the right sides. Of our facings together. And now we want to join our fronts to our back at the shoulder. Again, you want to use a good back tack there. Okay, so we've got basically a circle completed here. <clears throat> I need to press all four shoulder seams open.
check from the right side and make sure that everything is lying nice and flat and smooth. If it's not, I want to give it a little bit more help. complete this, I'm going to want to match my notches at the center back neck. I find it easiest to start at center and move to one side. And that way if I've made a mistake, I've only got to go half of the distance to correct it. Then I'm going to match my shoulder seams. the notch at the mid neckline and my notches at center front. And the edge of my facing is going to help um, maintain a nice clean crisp edge because it's fused right to the fold line. I'm going to come back to the other side match my shoulder seams, the mid neckline notch, and center fronts. Going with the so I want to start and running. And my shirt I'm going to this is going to be the side the get a clip set a of the bulk there garment right side out because we want to check and make sure that your neckline edges are going to match. If you have a little bit of trouble getting your corners popped out, you can carefully use the point scissors if you don't have a point turner. And we're going to want and make sure the length. But if look and cut down the move up, that my center fronts match the stitching. Again, my seam on the facing side, my seam will be left toe of the front. None of those little clipped pieces are flopping back to the wrong side. My seam line, so I can sort of this neckline seam line. That's what really helps the understitching to roll the seam line to the inside of the garment where it doesn't show. I'm not going to be able to get all the way to the corner, so I'm going to have to stop 
about an inch, inch and a half out. End with a back tack. Clip your needle thread. Then pull your bobbin thread to get your needle thread to come back to the underneath side so you don't have any little tails winging around outside. For people to look at. You want to check and make sure that everything is going to lie nice and flat. Now, if you look here at the shoulder seam of the applied facing and ended facing, you can see that I've got some seam kind of hanging out there and it doesn't look very attractive. When I tack my facing, I am going to fold that back in and under and I'm going to hold it the inside of the garment like that. It's going to neaten up On this other side, fold that little wing up side and let the seam line so it's out of the way nice clean there. Grab seam allowance of my shoulder seam, my thing, to do my back tack. My tacks don't show on the outside of my garment is lying very nicely the way that it should be. The face size and the same as the neckline. If don't make no funny thing on it, you're not going to lie on the line. Finish this up. You cut of the entering fold line to help me in that nice down the front. There you have it. And applying the neckline of a shirt. Now we could add a collar to this and when we do our camp shirt project we will be. In which case the collar would go onto the shirt neck before the facing did. But this gives us a very nice clean finished on the edge. With rising environmental concerns the need for recycled product is now catching on. This video shows how recycled cloths are made. But first, in the UK we throw away billions of plastic bottles every year. We're getting much better at recycling them, but did you know that they can also be turned into clothing? This amazing process starts here at the Bottle Recycling Centre. The first stage is shredding. When you throw away your bottle, you often leave a small amount of drink inside. Shredding all the bottles releases the unwanted liquid so it doesn't affect the quality of the plastic. The shredded bottles are then wrapped in cellophane and boxed up ready to be shipped around the world. It may be rubbish to us, but to the Chinese textile industry, this plastic waste is a valuable commodity. Recycled bottles arrive from all over the world to feed the busy clothing industry. Sorting separates the clear plastic from the colored stuff. Clear plastic can be made into white clothes or material that can be dyed, so it's extremely valuable. Most clear plastic bottles have colored lids and stickers on them, but these have got to go, so the bottles head for the baths. The colored caps are made of a different plastic which floats. A worker can then strain them off the top. Then there's a separate bath for the stickers, but the workers have to be careful around this one. It's corrosive caustic soda, very bad for the skin, but very good for removing labels. 
After all their swimming, what's left is a pile of clear plastic shreds. But it's rather wet. The next step is the ovens, where it's mixed with some light-colored plastics. To produce white cloth, you need some light-shaded material in the mix. The plastic will spend about 10 hours here in these rotating drums, slowly drying out. These workers have to maneuver their cart back and forth underneath the drums to catch the plastic as it falls out. But they've also got to mind their heads on all the other spinning ovens. So we've got our plastic bottles broken down and mixed to produce the right colors. But it's very hard to weave cloth from bits and pieces, so another step is needed. The mixture is sent through this rotating screw where it's heated to 270 degrees Celsius. This melts the plastic, but to make cloth we don't want a big lump, we need thread. The liquid plastic is forced through a sieve and emerges on the other side as great long strings which are collected in a container below. We've now got thread, but it isn't strong enough to make cloth yet. First it must be combined and stretched several times while being heated. This will bond the fibers together. Now it's taken ages to produce this material, but the next part of the process is to tear it apart again. The fluff that emerges is the raw substance you need to make polyester. However, that takes place in another factory altogether, so the workers here bail it up and send it on. It looks like cotton wool, but it's an entirely man-made substance created from your old bottles. This machine scrapes it all onto a very rough cloth which is loaded here, ready to be carded. Carding is where the bonded fibers are brushed together so they all lie in a similar direction, which strengthens the material. The sheet of polyester felt that emerges is now ready to be turned into thread. These machines will tease it out. They spin off mile after mile of pure polyester, which is collected on these bobbins. And finally, we reach the point where your old plastic bottles become cloth. Like a spider at the center of its web, the loom draws in thousands of threads and weaves a new sheet of polyester. To give it a smoother feel, there are still two more processes to go through. The first is very delicate. This machine creates tiny loops on its surface. The second stage is the opposite. Using a series of tough steel brushes, these spinning rollers catch and tear all the carefully made loops. The shredded surface helps give the material a soft, furry feel, making it far more comfortable to the touch. So we've turned our recycled bottles into polyester at last. Now it's time to make some clothes. Using a roll of material, stylists mark out the latest designs, being as economical as they can with their handy template. Although they're profiting from your rubbish, they don't want to create any more waste. So what started out as your rubbish was carefully sorted, then shredded, and turned into cloth. That cloth was shredded into fluff, spun into thread, and turned into fashion, from plastic bottles to polyester clothing. The United States of America, the European Union, China, Japan, India are the biggest markets for apparel. This is also the measure of for apparel consumption. On the other hand, apparel production is primarily concentrated in China, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam and Turkey. Demand for MMF yarns will grow faster than demand for natural fiber yarns. Knit fabric and apparel are performing better than their women counterparts in global trade. Asian countries like China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Thailand and Indonesia are among the leading countries in terms of installed machinery capacity. China alone has a share of around half of the world's total installed capacity for spinning and weaving machinery. Apparel production facilities are now located around the globe. Watch this video to learn 
how to find the perfect garment factory yes um i think you can never know enough about manufacturing um it's one of those things that you unfortunately if you haven't experienced it in industry for um a long time you you learn new things every every season and there are different pitfalls that come up um all the way along so by making your businesses as good as they can possibly be um i'm just going to show you a little stat um and I, I think it's just important to share this um according to business of fashion 95% of fashion startups fail in the first five years and that's really crazy and I love the next quote that I'm going to tell you and I think it sums up exactly what can happen. Uh, more than 95% of startup fashion businesses fail and it's not because the designer didn't hit the right creative notes. More often than not it's the lack of proper planning and funding and infrastructure that lets even the most creatively gifted designers down um, and that's really true people don't fail necessarily because they don't have amazing ideas or because people don't want their products it can just be something as simple as not having the right systems or the right knowledge in place to help you succeed luckily though uh, you guys obviously know that this stuff is important because you're on this call you probably leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of your peers so what is the solution to this and as Melza said you can never know you can never know enough about production um, and the more that you do know about production the better things are going to be for you and I really wanted to, I wanted to share with you just a, a very quick story um, of a girl I met last week. Um, she's called Emma. Uh, she makes handbags. And until about 18 months ago, she couldn't even sew. And until six months ago, she made everything by hand. Um, and here's what she told me. Um, sorting out my production has changed everything. We couldn't grow. We couldn't keep up with demand because I didn't have the headspace. I was just so tired and working so frantically. That was what she told me about her story before she found um, a, a factory, and now this is what she said to me afterwards, which is really exciting. Now I work with a factory that does all the sewing for me, and it has changed my life and my business. We can actually do all the fun stuff. Uh, we can make samples, we can design, and tell people what we're doing. That's pretty cool. Um, so I would like you to know, and if you could write this in the comments box as well, if you if you weren't spending all of your time hand making things or dealing with rubbish manufacturers or or go at making things go wrong factories, what would you actually spend your time to, time doing instead? Um, with PR. What else would you be doing? Okay, so I'm just going to read out some of the comments we've got. Um, we've got Grace who wants to be talking to journalists more, uh, and Lily who wants to spend more time. Designing, okay, that's fair. I guess that's why a lot of you start up fashion businesses in the first place. Um, I like this one. Uh, I've got Johnny who would actually like to spend some time with his girlfriend for once. Actually, there's quite a lot of comments here that are about work life balance. Um, and I just flicking through them, the rest of them seem to be about wanting to spend time on the parts that you actually like doing. So I guess for, for many of you who don't love churning out bag, for example, after bag after bag, but want to spend more time actually designing it. That's what you love doing. So, I think by now you can probably see that manufacturing is going to help your business. And so, Demelza, I think we should probably start talking uh, a little bit about what we're here for, um, how to find the right factory. So, we know why it's so important, um, but I just wonder if we can just talk about what you even start looking, what you need to do. Um, so, I guess the first thing is that you need to know about the different types of factory available. Now, I've heard of um, CM CMT factories, and I wonder if you could tell me about what that factory is and how that might differ to other types of factories out there. Okay, so um, for those of you who are making things already at home, um, you know how to produce your, your samples. And the sort of factory that you'd be looking for would be someone who can um, reproduce samples that you have made at home, um, potentially in a, in a better way. But that's called the CMT factory. And what it stands for is um, cut, make, and trim. Now, um, a CMT factory will only cut your fabrics, make them up, and, and put your trims on. Um, they won't provide any of the, the materials for, for your products. So um, when you're working with a CMT factory, what you're looking at is finding all of your suppliers separately. Um, mm. putting everything together that the factory needs for so the patterns, the fabric, um, the tech pack, we'll come on to that later, and sending them off to the factory who will cut the order, sew it and, and make it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Cut, make, trim, does what it says on the tin. Um, and what about other types of factories? So say if you don't 
want, if you don't have any idea about how to produce a sample, is there a factory that you can go to that will do all of the stuff that you don't need to do, that you don't know how to do? Yes, you can, you can work in a fully factored way, what's called a fully factored way. Um, this is usual for the sort of accessories, um, especially shoes, um, maybe some sort of uh, leather accessories. Um, it's where the factory, you will provide a, a spec, um, and that might be a design spec, literally a drawing, and they will um, either interpret the pattern for you and then find all the materials and then make it, or you might provide them with a spec and a pattern and then they'd find the materials and, and make it for you. So they're different um, levels of fully factored, um, but true fully factored is, is them uh, making it from, from sketch. Okay, and so what kind of, um, I guess if thinking about the kind of designers we might have on this call, um, what kind of designer would a, um, a fully factored production factory, what kind of designers would go to that kind of factory? Um, would they be people who have got loads of experience in fashion, or might they be people who actually have I guess not zero, but, but much less experience. Um, you'd think that it was for people who had less experience, but in actual fact, fully factored is more usual with large volume production. Um, mm. So the companies that are, are producing the samples would also have to buy in the materials, and mm. usually they'd have to buy in the minimum amount. So um, you'd find that if you were working fully factored, there would be minimums. Um, in order to get them to do it from start to finish. It's much more common for startups or emerging designers to be working in a CMT way. Yeah, I guess that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and how important is it that the factory that you that you, you decide that you want to go with, that is, is specialist? So for example, if you're a shoe designer, um, I do have to find a factory that specializes in shoes. If you're a um, designer of trousers, do you, if it's getting really specific here, do you have to find a factory that specialises in trousers? Yes, and you can actually break it down even further. There are different types of shoes and there are different types of trousers. Mm. So quite often the factory will be broken down according to the type of material. So um, if you take trousers as an example, trousers usually comes under the tailoring category, but it could come under a soft separate or even um, jersey. Um, all those things uh, require different skills in the sewing, so tailoring is a very different technique to stitching a fabric that's made of jersey. Um, so when you're choosing a factory, you actually have to think with the materials in mind as well as the, pro the, the um, type of product. Okay, and so I guess it, from the sounds of that, you really need to know what you're talking about before you even start if you start a search for a factory, you need to know what type of fabrics am I going to make this out of, what kind of materials am I going to need. Is it, is it really important to know that kind of stuff? Yes, absolutely. There's no point going into a factory without having your um, background knowledge of what it is you're wanting to produce, because you can um, go in there and, and end up talking about something that they don't do, and that inevitably wastes your time in theirs. So um, definitely working out exactly what it is you need from a factory is important before you go in there. Um, and so say if there's um, a designer, they, they have never studied fashion, they have just got some really great ideas, they've been absolutely desperate to start a label up, perhaps let's just say, let's say shoes again. Um, are there people that they could hire to help them find out about those materials? So would it be, um, would you be employing uh, someone freelance to help you, help you do that? Is, that? is that kind of information available? Um, yes, I mean there are two ways that you could go about it. So hiring someone who's worked in that product before, say shoes, for example, um, you could get an assistant designer who'd done shoes before. Um, they would be able to help you with the technical specifications. Um, obviously, you'd have to understand the um, the way the product is put together and the materials that go into it, and not just talking about sort of the upper. It's all the materials that go into the sole and, and what actually is going on inside that product that you don't see from the surface. Um, mm. You need to have that level of technical expertise before you can try and do something on your own. Um, alternatively, you find a factory who you can go and work in a sample room with. Um, in, in that case, you're going to have to um, visit them and sort of talk very closely with them about what it is you want because you can't um, you can't design something from scratch and leave it all to a factory. You won't necessarily get what it was you had in, in your head. Um, as a designer, you'll have very strong ideas about what it is that you want and what it's meant to look like. Um, mm. And handing it over to a factory without the right specifications and understanding of the technicalities, 
um, will mean that it's less likely you'll get back um, from the factory what it is you're expecting. Yeah, that's fair. So, okay, so I guess what we can wrap up from that is that you need to be prepared. So this isn't just a decision. You just don't go and talk to a factory before you've made those decisions. You go and talk to a factory once you've made those decisions. Yeah. And probably a good, good time then to go on to where do you look for a factory. So um, I, uh, I guess a good place to start is, is it best to work with a factory that is in in the, in the country that you live in, um, or is it better to uh, to work overseas, perhaps? Um, so it's entirely dependent on what you're trying to do. Um, there are factories all over the world, and they're all doing different things, and they all do different things in different price categories, in different levels of quality, um, in different um, quantities. So you need to think again, what's my product? What's the likelihood of me getting um, production orders on it? Uh, what are those order is going to look like, how many am I going to sell of each one, and then thinking about what's it made of, what do I need to provide to the factory, am I going to leave it to the factory or am I going to give them the materials, and that's going to make you realise about how much movement you've got to do with uh, your supply chain, so how the shipping will affect what you're trying to do, um, mm -hmm. and then you've got to really think about what skills are actually available in each of those countries. So um, I would recommend that when you're starting out, you try and find things, and especially if you haven't done it before, you try and find things as close to you as possible because the closer they are to you, the more control you have over the problems. Now, you might think at this sort of stage, um, producing in um, wherever you are, and, and if it's, for example, where I'm London, um, it's going to be more expensive, say, than it is in other countries. Um, however, if you're starting out and you're going to factories for the first time and working with factories, then having that sort of personal contact with them is going to actually save you lots of money in the long run. So um, when you're thinking of production, it's not just about the make price. It's not just about what they say um, mm -hmm. it will cost for that one product. It's how much it's going to cost. Um, with all factors considered, and I would consider at your stage in the game, um, problems going wrong is going to be your biggest <laughs> um, added cost, yeah. and you need to be in a position where you can um, control them as, as much as possible. So um, I would advise going close to home. Um, there are re other reasons why you would, and there are other reasons why you wouldn't, but um, at, at the earlier stage in the game, I think working with a factory that you can be accessible to is, is very important. Yeah, I guess that, that makes sense with um, you, you going to visit them, doing meetings and things. So, okay, so I'm a designer, I'm just starting my label, I have n never even ventured into um, the world of manufacturing before, or, or that, or say I'm a, an established designer and I have worked with factories, but I want to find a new one. Where, where do you start with this? Um, is this just something that you just can Google how do I find a factory? Um, or is it a little bit more complex than that? Um, you can Google how do I find a factory, but I would say that if possible, the best factories are those that have come through recommendations. Okay. Um, so if you know anyone else who's been doing something similar to you, and, and people are you know very protective over their good factories because um, especially in, in locally in London, there's a very high demand for um, capacity um, in factories at the moment, so mm. it, is in, it, it is going to be difficult um, for you to find things um, from, your, from your peers, um, mm. but it's worth asking. I do know of designers who do um, talk to their peers and get recommendations. Right. It's also worth asking your suppliers because they will probably be supplying two factories or two other designers working with factories and they are often send things on. So they might know, they might have a better idea of the sort of landscape of what's going on mm. around you. Um, moving on from that, there are support networks um, who provide um, databases and there are some trade shows, local trade shows. So um, the one I can think of in particular is, is the one that we run at DISC. Um, mm. Twice a year we have a, a local manufacturing trade show. The next one is coming up in October, and then um, there's a database in the UK called 
um, the UKFT, UK Fashion and Textiles, which is a trade organization for fashion and textiles in the UK. And they have a database called Let's Make It Here. Um, mm. You can go on there and you can type in what you need and, and all the addresses will come up. But as you can see, as you move further away from the source, and obviously the furthest away being the internet, um, mm -hmm. you're going to get less um, chance of, of finding one that is actually really good because you won't have that sort of hands-on experience with them. So finding factories on the internet um, is, is definitely possible and you might you know, hit one that's, that's good, um, but you'd be better off trying to narrow it down a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, just a question about factories and being online. Do, does every factory have a website? I mean, are these the kind of people who are out there marketing themselves and um, being really easy to find? Or is it maybe more likely that then they don't have um, they don't have the best one? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, the ones who are working at full capacity or, or very high capacity, or even um, ones that just haven't got around to it yet, don't have websites. And I think this is one of the um, things that we've seen over the last few years is the amount of uh, manufacturers who are starting to get online, which is good. Um, mm. But those that don't need to uh, wouldn't necessarily be on any of the, of, of, on the internet or even on any of the databases. So um, again, it's it's coming back to trying to find them maybe at trade shows um, or through personal um, introductions. Yeah, and now that if you were to meet a factory at a trade show. Um, would you be expected to, I guess, sign a deal with them there and then? Or actually is it a, a slightly wider conversation that you meet someone and then you go, okay, we'll, we'll take this um, we'll take this to email, we'll take this to a phone conversation, or perhaps I'll come and meet you? Well, I always say that it's much better um, from a point of view of getting your foot in the door to actually try and get your foot in the door um, of the factory. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry for the, for the pun. No, it's good, um, I like it. If... Um, if you meet someone at a trade show or, or even if you phone up a factory and you tell them everything there and then mm. that you want to do, it's much easier for them to say, actually, it's not right for us. If you actually go there, get your foot in the door and see what they're doing and explain things, um, explain what you want and get, and get down to the nitty-gritty of looking at the product, um, they are much more likely to take you on. Um, so I would say do go to trade shows. Don't... Mm let your first, and it's everyone's instinct, is to go in with all their worries. So you go up to your manufacturer and say, well, what's your minimum and um, how do you charge and, you know, is there a surcharge and, you know, ca how long does it take you to make things? So if you ask all those questions first off, it's not giving a very positive um, <laughs> yeah. sort of outlook. So you try not to go, try to go in more professionally and ask them um, positive things. Um, look like you know what you're talking about and mm -hmm. arrange for a meeting at the factory as opposed to um, spilling all your woes on them in the first <laughs> meeting. I think that would maybe put some of them off. Yeah, I guess that, um, that makes sense. Um, if you were say, sh uh, making a short list of, of factories um, to go and meet, um, is, it, is it best to meet more than one, so to try and go to maybe a handful and, and see what they're like rather than just, I guess, putting all your eggs in, basket, in, in one basket and going to one? and hoping that they're going to be the one. Yes, absolutely. I think if you're going to do um, your initial research, you want to be making a short list. And you'll make the short list based on what they've told you, either face to face or what you've seen on their website or what you've been told. Um, and then you'll narrow it down to just a few and you'll go and visit them. And you know, there's nothing to stop you from trying a sample with each of them and mm. comparing it um, and then making your decision. When you go in and speak to a factory, obviously you're going to be suggesting that there'll be big orders coming. But remember that you are the boss. You're the one that's taking them on. They've got mm. to impress you in the first instance. So there's nothing to stop you from asking each of them to make you a sample to a spec mm. that you will pro have provided and then to compare each one and decide from that. Um, of course, then you would get a price, which would also help you to decide which one you want to go for. Yeah. Um, but bear in mind that each one of these samples will be charged and sometimes the factory will charge you um, two or three times for a first sample and so it's to stop people from just getting one done in, you know, in each place. It's yeah. not really worth their time. So you yeah. don't want to be sampling unnecessarily. So if you feel very confident that they can produce your sample, place a few. And when I say a few, I don't think it's 
you know, it's not 20, it's sort of two or three to compare. That should be your um, your very short shortened list. And then compare them with quality, price, and, and generally how they've felt like to work with. Hmm. Um, and so if, you, if you've, done, you've done some samples, I mean, obviously you have to pay for those samples. This isn't just something that people are going to do for free. Yeah. Um, would, would that be something that, so you've gone to a first meeting, would you, would you place that order for that sample in that meeting, or is that something you might do um, afterwards? Um, do you have to commit there and then, basically? No, you don't have to commit, but you do have to look serious. So um, okay. if you go into a factory and spend an hour speaking to the factory manager, and if it's a small sort of CMT unit, that might be um, the difference between an hour of, of somebody actually working on a sewing machine, because usually uh, you know, the factory manager is going to be making things as, as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you are taking time out of their day to meet with them. So it's best to establish um, that you are going to give them something when when you get there. Um, mm. So so talk to them before you get there and sort of work out um, what it is they can do um, mm. without being too negative, you know, without <laughs> asking them all those negative questions. And then yeah. get your foot in the door with, and take a, a tech pack with a sample, take something to show mm -hmm. them. Um, if necessary, take fabric. They could start there and then. They don't have to, but um, you want to leave that meeting feeling like you've uh, you know, found someone who you can start trialing with. If you get there and you think that they're terrible, you can always take it away again. Mm, um, yeah. But it's best to to let them feel that, you know, they have engaged in business with you. Yeah. And now, um, you just said about it's a good idea to bring along fabric with you. Um, is it a good idea to take anyone along with you? Um, a, I guess, business partner, or perhaps even a pretend business partner. I assume you probably can't take your mum along with you. <laughs> Well, no, you get, you know, mothers can be quite good. <laughs> um, no, I think um, when you're going to a factory, it depends how you feel. Some people are confident enough to um, sit in a meeting um, on their own. Um, it can be beneficial to take someone with you in an instance that you um, you need to sort of second um, have, have that second person to give you the. Yeah, yeah. So if it's a business partner, you'd say. Um, you know, come along because we might be talking finances and you deal with finances. Um, it is quite good also the other way around to say um, to go to a factory on your own and then say I'm going to have to run this decision past my business partner who's back in the office and that way you know you've got a sort of get out clause of, of making any decisions there and then in the meeting. Um, yeah. so, so it can work both ways but um, generally you'd go there um, with the people that were needed for the meeting. Hmm. And is it okay, so you, you've gone there, you've, you've taken either someone with you or you haven't, and you've taken some um, fabric. Um, is it okay to, for example, ask for a tour of the factory or to ask to see their equipment or to ask to see samples that they might have produced for someone else? Yes, absolutely. So when you get to the factory, um, you arrive, obviously, you might be taken into a meeting room. Um, in the meeting room, they might have a rail of, of samples that they can show you. Um, but it's, no, there's no point visiting a factory if you don't actually see what's going on behind the scenes. So um, once you've sat down and had the initial discussions about what it is you want and what they can do and they've shown you some of their samples, um, then yes, a factory tour would be absolutely the next thing. Um, they'd take you around the factory. You'd get to see the type of machinery that they're using. It's very important. Another decision when deciding which factory to take on, can they actually make um, what you want and also do they have the right machines to finish it in the correct way to do all the processes that you need and, um, and then you'd meet potentially some of the people who will be making the things and um, you want to get a feel that you know the factory is working well, you want to see that the machines are busy, that will show that there's people working with them. They might tell you who they're working with, it depends on um, what agreements they've got in place with the designers they already are working with. Some might not be allowed to. Um, okay. Most of them will, um, but definitely getting a feel for what they're about is very important. Yeah, and um, because as, the, as an emerging diet designer, we, talk, we talked a little bit about how you might have low minimums, it might be that you're not going to meet those minimums. Apart from being really professional, are there any other ways that you can, I guess, impress the manufacturer? Um, I guess make yourself seem slightly bigger and more impressive than you actually are? Is there anything that they look out for, in, in especially new designers? 
I think I mean it's just very important to to speak in the correct terms. So to learn all the jargon, and um, I think that that will be on the course that um, that we've put together yeah, um, yeah. to actually find out what those terms are, what people um, would refer to in the industry, and mm. to be really confident with that the way you talk about them. Um, that's all um, part of building up your relationship and um, impressing your manufacturer. I'm, I'm, I do think that when you're working manufacturers, actually, and a lot of people would um, maybe work in the, the other way, um, you should be quite earnest and you should be quite honest with them because these are people, at the end of the day, who um, are going to try their best for you. And mm. they don't respond well to sort of the empty threats route or, um, you know, I'm a designer and you owe me, you know, sort of this. You've yeah. got to really respect that these people are working um, long hours hard um, for you. Um, they're producing the products to the best of their abilities with mm. the um, resources that you've provided them. So, um, you know, they want it to work just as much as you do because at the end of the day, a factory doesn't want a load of returns from you in a dispute and a non-payment for the next two months. They want to get it right the first time. So being honest and working in a way that's um, professional is, is really important when, when working with a factory. And sometimes those relationships where you have been there, talked to them, um, have you know maybe compromised in certain areas um, are the best ones for when they're trying to make those decisions on who to put first in the production queue. Um, when yeah. I used to work in China, they um, always used to say to me, because I'd go out there uh, three times a season, and they'd say, you know, we spend hours in meetings talking about Burberry and um, all these other big brands, but then we say, how are we going to get Demelza's to the front of the queue? Because she comes <laughs> out and gives us a bo chocolates and, um, you know, talks to us and, and understands why um, things take as long as they do, or you know where mm. problems occur. So, you know, building up relationships is really, really important. Yeah, um, that, yeah, that's that seems totally understandable. And actually, I guess it's the way that good business is done all over the world, whether it's fashion or manufacturing or, or whatever. Um, now, we you said it a, a bit earlier when we was asking about when you go to trade shows, the first thing that you shouldn't ask is what are your minimums, what are your prices, and all the kind of problems that you really want to ask, but you maybe don't feel you can ask. Um, in that first meeting, it, it, is that when you can bring those things up? And how would you recommend people do bring them up? Okay, so if you're taking one of um, a factory for the first time, then you can definitely go in and say that you're placing part of your production with them. You don't have to say that this is your first mm. time working with a factory. You don't have to say that this is all your production. So that's one way to get over the minimums problem, is to say, I'm just going to try you with a small mm. bucket this season. And I think that's probably the easiest yeah. way to get around it. Um, and then you could say to them, yeah. well, you know, if, if I do just place a couple of styles with you, um, they'll be the smaller dockets because I, d you know, I don't want to commit to season. Um, but is that going to incur a surcharge, or would you do it for me this time round? You know, based on the fact that I'm going to give you more mm. in the future. Mm. You're so wise, <laughs> uh, very, very wise. Um, and um, again, talking about what you might be expected to do in that meeting, would you have to pay a deposit in that meeting, for example, if you said, right, I would love you, I'd love to make a sample with you, uh, do you have to pay there and then, or is that something that they might invoice you for and then you pay in, in 30 days' time or something? Um, so you would, you would negotiate the payment terms in that first meeting, and you would negotiate... Um, well, the, the terms of, of all the working, so you negotiate um, lead times, you negotiate payment terms, um, you might negotiate um, surcharges, um, and you negotiate who was responsible for delivery as well. So um, all that information needs to be upfront and agreed before you place any work. Now, mm. if they say, um, because you're a new customer, we want you to pay upfront, then you can try and negotiate some sort of payment terms with them, maybe a deposit followed by the balance on shipment. Mm. Um, that would be usual. Um, what would be preferable, obviously, would be um, you know, paying 30 days after you'd received the goods, but they're not necessarily um, in this economic climate going to allow you that. 
um, when you're first starting out. So you mm -hmm. do have to bear that in mind and work out your cash flow accordingly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so we've covered quite a lot there in that first meeting. Um, I think it would be really useful just to talk about um, CMT factories, just, just for the last section, because actually, like you said, that's probably going to be the type of factory that most of the guys in this call are going to be working with. Um, so you, you've, you've done a sample, um, you love it. Um, when you actually start production, what do you have to supply? So, I mean, you talked about the fact that you have to supply the factories uh, with, with fabrics. Um, what else might you have to give them in your docket? Okay, so um, you would have what's called a bill of materials, which will tell you all the ingredients to go into the one product that you're trying to do. So if it's a dress, mm -hmm. um, you'd need the, the main fabric. If it had a zip, it would be a zip, the trims. Um, you'd have... Um, so you'd have all, all the the sort of ingredients, so the raw materials that go into that one style. Um, once you've worked out what those are, um, you'd also give them a pattern. Um, you might need to give them the pattern in the different sizes, um, okay, yeah. sort of graded set, and because they'll be making more than one size. Some factories will do this themselves, but you need to check. And you'd also give them a tech pack. The tech pack is all the technical specifications of how yeah. to make your sample. And then finally, you'd give them an actual sample, or you'd give them um, a, a, what's called a toile, which is um, a sort of mock-up of the sample. If yeah. you're not giving an actual sample, then the tech pack is going to be a lot more detailed. Um, mm -hmm. If you're giving them a sample, then you're going to have to work on a tech pack, um, but it might be less detailed. But it will depend totally on what you're giving them um, to go on. Yeah, um, and okay, so if you don't know how to produce your tech pack or, or you're not too sure about how to grade um, your set, for example, um, would, your, would that um, CMT factory help you at all with that? Or is really the onus on you to provide all of those things? So a factory is going to make your product in the cheapest way possible for them. That's what mm -hmm. they'll do, um, unless you specify how you want it made. And that is how a factory would think. And the reason is is because they want to make the most margin on it. They want to make the biggest profit from making your product. Yeah. So if you don't provide anything um, except for a pattern and a sample that you've maybe made at home, they are going to make it in the cheapest possible way. And they'll send it to you. And if you don't like it, they will have held up their end of the contract. And you will be in the position where you're unhappy and you may even take it to a dispute with them. Um, in this instance, you're in really deep water because you haven't actually given them any specification whatsoever as to how you wanted it. You're just going on the fact that you think they should know what quality is, which is a very dangerous position to be in. Um, so it is absolutely fundamental that you provide uh, a tech pack. If mm. you're wanting them to do grading, your tech pack must include your sizing specifications for every grade mm. and all the things that go within that as well. So your tech pack really is your contract with your factory and it is the difference between getting a product that you are unhappy with and something that you absolutely know is what you want. Mm. The textile and apparel industry continued to be the second largest employment generating sector in India. It offers direct employment to over 35 million manpower in the country and with an additional employment of 60 million manpower in the allied sector. Total employment figure stands at 105 million manpower. The consumer wardrobe has changed from only need based clothing to occasional specific dressing. It generally become more detailed oriented. Women shoppers are gaining more importance with their higher spending power and requirement of specific clothing for different purposes. The growth of apparel e-tailing is fueled by the changing lifestyles of domestic cons consumers and increasing penetration of technology. The Indian domestic apparel market is expected to grow at a CAGR of 9%, higher per capita consumption, favorable 
consumer demographics and increase in prices will drive the growth of the apparel market in India. Currently, men's wear is the biggest segment of apparel market. Kids wear, women's wear are growing faster than men's wear segment. Among kids wear, girls segment has the highest growth area, denim, active wear and t-shirts are high growth category in men's wear segment. In the women's wear segment, denim, inner wear and t-shirts are expected to demonstrate relatively higher growth rate. In the boys wear segment, growth rate is highest for denims followed by winter wear and t-shirts. In the girls wear segment, growth rate is highest for denim followed by winter wear and t-shirts. This video gives an overview of the retail industry in India. Hello everyone, let us take a look at what exactly is retail. What is retailing? Before we start understanding retail, let us understand some basic terminologies. Market. It is any system or place where parties are engaged in the exchange of either goods or services. Goods. Tangible physical products which are transferred from the seller to the buyer to fulfill the latter's needs. Services. An economic activity that is intangible, not stored and does not involve ownership. Consumer. An individual who buys products for self-consumption and not for sale. The word retailing has its origin from the French verb retailer which means to cut up and refers to one of the fundamental activities which is to buy large quantities and to sell in smaller quantities. Now we come to the definition given by Philip Kotler. Retailing includes all the activities involved in selling goods or services to the final consumer for personal, non-business use. Retailing is the final stage of any economic activity and the steps needed to place merchandise made elsewhere into the hands of the consumers. The goods are produced by the manufacturer which are sent to the wholesaler or distributor which are then sent to the retailer from where the consumer finally buys the product. Retailers provide important functions that increase the value of the products and services. The value creating functions are breaking the bulk, providing services, providing assortment of goods and services and holding inventory. Now let us rewind to the time when retail was born. Let us trace the path of retail evolution from the primitive traditional form to present the day digital retail. A barter is an old method of exchange. This system has been used for centuries to exchange services and goods for other services and goods in return. This was when retail came into existence. People started setting up shops for exchange of product. Then came money, which revolutionized the whole concept of retailing. While barter is considered to be the oldest form of retail trade, retail in India has evolved to support the unique needs of a country given its size and complexity. Huts, mandis, melas have always been a part of the Indian landscape. They still continue to be present in most part of the country. The PDS or public distribution system would easily emerge as the single largest retail chain existing in the country. The system was started in 1939 in Bombay and consequently extended to large cities and towns. The Khadi and village industries was also set up post-independence. Today, there are more than 7050 KVIC stores across the country. Then in 1863, Durant and Spencers established the first organized retail setup in India. Under the British government, many retail markets came up, such as the Hawk Market in Kolkata and Crawford in Mumbai. One of the leaders in the field of retail was Raymond's and DCM. The Raymond distribution network today comprises 20,000 retailers and over 429 showrooms. In 1931, Barter set up stores which became successful retail model. After 1991, the income level of middle class people started to rise with the invention of internet. The customers got more aware about the product and the features. Due to rapid development and in infrastructure, urbanization, etc., there was a sudden boost in the retail industry. In 2012, India was ranked fifth on the Global Retail Development Index as one of the key foreign investment destinations worldwide.
in the present scenario the indian market is booming with malls and supermarkets the modern retail encompasses the following retail formats departmental store which offers a huge assortment of soft and hard goods at average price and customer service discount stores offer wide array of products at competitive price warehouse store offers low cost high quantity in a warehouse kind of layout Variety stores offers extremely low cost goods with limited selection. Mom and pop stores, small retail outlets owned by individual or family. Specialty stores, specializes on specific merchandise like shoes, toys, puzzles, garments, etc. Convenience stores Limited amount of merchandise idle for emergencies. Hypermarket huge volume of exclusive merchandise at low margins. Supermarkets self service store anywhere between 20,000 to 40,000 feet. Category killers. Supplies wide assortment in single category for lower prices. Vending machines, automatic machine where customers drop money to acquire products. E-retailers, customers can order shop through the internet and the merchandise is dropped at the customer's doorstep. Today, with the population of 1.2 billion, the retail industry in India adds up to $600 billion. Retailing in India accounts for about 22% of its GDP. Indians love shopping. Organized retail in India is pegged at 4%. Retail market is expected to nearly double to $1 trillion by 2020. India's e-commerce industry, which is worth $17 billion, is likely to cross the $100 billion mark over the next five years. After the recession in India in 2008, the retail industry witnessed a sudden boost in areas like e-commerce, real estate, rise in disposable income, working youth, etc. Now here we will discuss about the apparel industry in India. How basically here uh, in this particular uh, module, we will talk about the overview of the global market how the global market is for apparel, then we'll examine the apparel industry in India, what are the different uh, uh, SWOT analysis are there, how the Indian, which direction Indian apparel industry is going, we'll discuss about the various categories, different categories are there, product categories are there, uh, in that particular categories where India is basically and its nature, what is the, the nature of this uh, business, then size and as well as we will discuss the various de uh, developments what happened in recent years. So <clears throat> moving ahead with this particular thing, uh, this particular module, so first thing is that the global apparel consumption, what is the global apparel consumption is there? That uh, some Hindi proverb is there, roti kapra or makan, that is the bread, we talk about the shelter, we talk about the apparel or garment. So these are the three basic necessity. We need food to eat, we need uh, shelter where we can, uh, we need a ho house where we can, we can, we can stay and we need apparel where what we can wear. These are the basic three necessities. So in one another sense we can, I can say that, in lighter sense I can say that apparel industry is never dying industry. The industry till the time human existence will be there, this business will be there because this is the part of the basic necessity of a human being. The destinations will keep changing like uh, initially we are having the, the major apparel clusters was there in USA, it was in European countries because of the increase of the cost of the production, the production hub has shifted from uh, this western country to uh, south asian country that is in india we are having the the cluster of apparel 
we have in China, we are having Vietnam, we are having Indonesia, we are having in uh, Bangladesh. So, the, the, the shifting happened, the base production base has shifted from uh, western countries like uh, European countries and uh, uh, America, it has shifted to uh, Asian countries. And nowadays, we have the African countries like Ethiopia and other uh, uh, other countries nearby which are also having the, they are also growing up in that particular uh, production. But major, if you talk about that, this uh, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, some part of uh, Japan and uh, China, these all are more than 60 percent of the production hub is here. The total production, worldwide production, more than around 60 percent are basically happening in Europe, uh, in China, Japan, India. These are the, the where basically the major production hub is, Indonesia and uh, Bangladesh and all. Then if you talk about the consumption hub, around more than the 60 percent of the consumption hubs are basically in USA, in European countries, some part of Japan and uh, part of China. So basically more than 60 percent of the consumption hub in these countries and more than 60 percent of the uh, production hub in uh, this uh, Asian countries. So uh, if you talk about the, uh, the, the production, the, it is as I discussed that the, it's the production is majorly concentrated in China, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam and uh, Turkey. So, uh, the overview of uh, global market, if you talk about the how the, what is the overview of the global market, how it is, uh, how the things are moving in the, in the apparel market, the demand of man-made fiber yarn is going to grow faster than the demand of natural fiber as per what literature review says. The knit fabric and apparel are performing better than their woven counterparts in global trade. So knits and uh, the fabrics are growing faster than the woven fa fabric. This is the, uh, uh, the, the literature view has also been taken from uh, the Technopack compendium. It has published in 2012 and it has published in 2015 also the research has been taken and they have given this particular different data are there and apart from that different sources are also uh, given uh, different data for this. Then uh, like Asian countries like China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Thailand, Indonesia, these are the among leading countries in terms of installed machine capacity. If we talk about the machine capacity, so these are the Asian, these Asian, uh, Asian countries are there which are the leading countries in the installed machine capacity if you talk about. China alone has a share of around half of the world total installed capacity for spinning and weaving uh, the machineries. Then uh, uh, moving from global to India, how, what is the Indian, what is the status of Indian garment industry, what is the in, uh, status of uh, apparel industry in India. The textile and apparel industry in India continues to be the second largest employing employment generating sector. It offers direct employment of over 35 million in the country and with an additional employment of 60 million in the allied sectors. Total employment figures stands is 105 million as per the Ministry of Textile Data. The consumer wardrobe, now if you talk about the how consumer is demanding, what consumer needs and wants are there. So now consumer wardrobe has changed from need based clothing. Earlier we are looking for the clothing for our need, basic need to complete, fulfill our basic need. What I discussed earlier that these, the apparel is a part of the basic need. That is why it is not never dying industry. But now the consumer wardrobe, if you see that the consumer wardrobe has been changed, in the, the, the consumer's perception also have been changed. 
it's not only the nowadays the need based clothing they have changed as a occasion specific dressing and it's gradually becoming more detail oriented we talk about the detailed in terms of value addition in the garment in uh, like we we talk about the beads work we talk about the embroidery we talk about the different type of the prints we talk about the different shapes of the garment we talk about the different silhouette of the garment these all are basically the different uh, detailed oriented garment we are detailing we want in the garment we it's, it's the become the fashion status so whether we are imitating the the stars we are imitating the uh, the our heroes but we want that of the garments we want something different from the crowd we want to look ourselves something different from the crowd so it's not only the need based what it was earlier now it's more about the occasional specific training uh, dressing like different occasions are there different type of dress garment we are having and it's more about the detailing about the women shoppers are gaining more importance with this higher spending power and requirement of the specific clothing for a different purpose if you see about the detailing or what type the the changes happened fashion changes happened it's more in the field of the women's garment because the women shopper are more important in terms of they are their higher spending power so they are ready to pay more if the garment suits as per their need, uh, as per their choice the growth of the apparel e-tailing is fueled by the changing of lifestyle of domestic consumer and increasing penetration of the technologies the different technologies are there and that technologies are we are using we are using the wrinkle free garment we are using the different type of technology we are using for a uh, a uh, different washes we are having so that is uh, that also technology has come into existence along with the need the india domestic apparel market is expecting to grow with a cagr cagr compound annual growth rate that cagr of 9% as per the technopack compendium 2012 higher per capita consumption favorable uh, customer uh, demographic and increase in prices this will drive the growth of apparel market in india currently men's wear is the biggest segment of the apparel market currently in india the men's wear is the biggest segment in the in the apparel market so if you see about the trend what is the trend in indian apparel industry the kids and men's wear are growing faster than the men's segment so although men's segment as a major chunk we we talk about the major uh, portion share is there in the uh, in the men's wear garment the kids wear and women's wear are growing faster than the men's wear segment in india the what the trend says among the kids wear girls segment has the highest growth rate among the kids wear segment itself girls segment has the highest growth rate denim active wear t-shirts are high growth categories in the men's wear segment if you talk about the men's wear segment in that particular segment denim active wear t-shirts they have the high growth uh, categories in in this particular segment in the women's wear segment denim inner wear t-shirts are expected to dem- demonstrate relatively higher growth rate than other seg- other things in the boys wear segment if we talk about the specifically about the boys wear segment the growth rate is highest for denims followed by winter wear and t-shirts in girls wear segment growth rate is the highest in the denims followed by winter wear and t-shirts so uh, we discuss about that about the different uh, global what is the global overview how the what is the production hub what are the uh, uh, consumption hub major production hub we discuss is concentrated in in um, major asian countries around 60% of the consumption hub is concentrated in these asian countries like india bangladesh china pakistan indonesia and uh, more than 60% of the consumption hubs are there in the european country and uh, america and canada then we discuss about the 
about the India uh, garment industry in India. In the garment industry in India, uh, the garment industry is in India is uh, is working. Uh, the compound annual growth rate of garment industry in India is nine percent. Has been uh, the data has been taken from the Technopack compendium that published in two thousand twelve, and uh, the industry is growing faster. In fact, the the men's uh, men's uh, uh, segment has the major chunk of the share than other segment and uh, we discuss about the different segment within the different segments we are having the men's segment we are having the women's segment we have the girls we are having the boys segment so we have this uh, we have seen that in different segment also we are uh, in that what what particular categories of the garment are in demand is growth is in demand and that particular growth of the garment uh, has been forecasted again by the Technopack compendium and definitely uh, the Indian garment industry, the future of the Indian garment industry is very bright in terms of that we are having the low, domestic consumption has also increased a lot. Earlier we are looking for the stitch fabric, stitch garment and we are going to tailor now we, people are more towards the uh, they are going for the branded garments. Earlier, our it was need based. Now we are talking about the we are looking for detail base. In earlier, we we are having the two three sets of the fab of the garment. We are talking now we are talking about the maybe thirty forty sets of the garment. So now the the I mean to say that the it's never going to die industry. This industry is going to flourish a lot till the time human being is there existence of human being is here then definitely till the time the demand of apparel cannot go down it will be keep flourishing the definitely the base will be changing in india if you talk about the india earlier the manufacturing base was concentrated in ncr uh, Ch uh, chennai ba uh, bangalore and, and ludhiana and tirupur so it was like the ncr was known for uh, uh, all the uh, high fashion garments, Ludhiana is for sweaters, Tirupur is for knitwear products, uh, Bangalore and Chennai was for more basic products like the shirt, trousers, jacket and all. But due to the operational cost, as the operation cost has increased a lot, people are migrating, the factories, the, the entrepreneurs are migrating from the center of the uh, of of uh, the factory from the center of the city to outskirts even the new destinations have come up as a orissa the 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 jharkhand they are also the investment is going on orissa is uh, one of the most preferred uh, preferred destination for the apparel manufacturing even in in karnataka even in tamil nadu the the factories are shifting towards the the rural areas where the manpower and other uh, uh, cheap labor and cheap land can uh, is uh, are available so that the operating cost can be reduced so even the shifting is happening within india also the shifting is happening from one place to another place but definitely the the future of garment industry is is very bright and uh, uh, definitely it is going to uh, do well with the whatever the resources available with us. You have come to the end of this particular unit. To summarize this unit, you have learned about how the manufacture of apparel begin and the impact of the industrial revolution. You have also received an overview of global market, country-wise share of global production, apparel's contribution to India's GDP, the size of the apparel industry in India, both domestic and export segment-wise, product wise, category wise as well as market projection. You have also gotten glimpse of the employment scenario in Indian apparel sector and reviewed recent development in Indian apparel industry. Thank you very much.